in culture and arts. It's our city. It's our channel. Hey, just go! Okay. Morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, June 19th, 2018. This is a regular meeting of the Board of the Los Angeles Police Commissioners. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Good morning. Let the record reflect. Commissioners Soboroff, Johnson, Figueroa Villa, and McLean Hill are present, and we have a quorum. Okay. Item number one, we're going to hold all of the consent agenda items until after closed session today. Let's go to item number two, okay. which is item number 2A is the verbal presentation um, by uh, Dean Knott. Is he here? Oh, Jack. Come on up. Mr. President, while the Dean's walking forward, did you like to say for the Commission and uh, audience information, uh, both Chief Beck and Chief Moore are attending a funeral this morning for a retired captain who passed away last week. That's why they're not here today. Morning, Dean. Dean, not, uh, dean Jack Knott is the, uh, the Dean of the USC uh, Saul Price School of Public Policy. Um, he's here to uh, talk to us about a program that uh, is uh, going on at USC called the Law Enforcement Advanced Development Program. Dean, I know you're a busy guy, a lot of public <laughs> policy going on, and we appreciate your coming, talking to the public and to the commission about the program that you have, so. Thank you very much. Uh, great uh, pleasure to be here. I appreciate this uh, invitation. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a, an exciting new uh, training program uh, for the LAPD. Uh, it's a partnership at USC actually between the Saul Price School of Public Policy and the Suzanne Dwork Peck School of Social Work. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do as partner, and we have partnered with uh, LA uh, Police Academy, Training Academy, primarily with uh, Luann uh, Pinnell, who is the director of the Academy. She's done a terrific job as, uh, in our partnership. Uh, and we're seeking to, uh, here's the goals, let me give you the goals of the program. Uh, the goals of the program are really uh, focused around the issue of reducing violence uh, and alternative approaches, especially to special populations. Uh, retention of, and uh, career development for the police, uh, also increasing trust between the police and the community. Those are the three major goals. And we worked closely with Luann to try to not duplicate uh, what's already at the Police Training Academy, but to have value added uh, to make this something really supplementary uh, to what's at the Police Academy. Uh, it's been funded this first year by the Pritzker Foundation, uh, and we're uh, also talking with the LA Police Foundation uh, to uh, also possibly contribute to the continuation of this program. And then both schools, uh, the School of Social Work and Public Policy, have put some of their own uh, funding in the, into this program as well. So the program is uh, a mix of online uh, as well as in person. Uh, and so it's got a pretty innovative kind of program format. Um, and we uh, contracted with an online provider that w both the Price School and the School of Social Work use. It's a company called 2U, and they donated their services uh, for this pilot year. Uh, so there are cohort meetings uh, of 40 officers. That's how many we accepted into the program. Uh, that occur uh, throughout the program. There's six hours of instruction in person and three throughout the certificate program every Dean, four how months. Many apply, how many applied? Um, uh, this, I don't remember how many applied to the initial one, but uh, for the fall, uh, we have over 80 applicants already. And, and how many will you take? We're hoping to take 40. Uh -huh. uh, so we, you know, we're expecting to have probably oh, by the time, you know, the deadline, maybe over 100 applicants for 40 positions. That's uh, what we're hoping for. Okay. Uh, so it is uh, selective. I mean, the first year was a pilot. It was, uh, we just started it up and I don't recall exactly, but we didn't have any difficulty at all uh, finding the 40 people. Uh, 
So the online instruction, there are two groups of 20 officers each, so you want to be able to see everybody uh, on the screen when you're online. That's why we divide it into two cohorts. There's two hours of instruction at a time, and there are 11 sessions total, uh, as we did it one per month. Uh, the program also have what we call reflective logs. Uh, these are short 300-word entrees that the participants reflect on their experience in the program, in the community. Uh, they also do a community engagement project. Uh, that's a capstone project. It starts at the beginning, and as they learn go through it, they have to do a real project that they can show has an impact in the community that they actually work in. So it's in real time applied. It's not waiting till the end of the program and then applying it. Here are the program elements. These are the courses that we offer over the course of this past year. Uh, we did a course on human trafficking, community engagement. Uh, we're particularly interested in youth populations. Uh, dealing with issues of child abuse and neglect, uh, LGBTQ population, uh, po populations with mental illness, homeless populations, substance abuse, uh, domestic violence, uh, civil rights uh, issues and movements, uh, and then extremism, uh, and including violent extremism, and then conflict resolution. And the nice thing about the partnership between the two schools is that the School of Social Work brings a clinical knowledge and understanding of dealing with mentally ill uh, people and uh, you know, domestic violence, whereas we bring a more of a policy and a, public, a, a nonprofit organization and community engagement perspective. So it's been a really nice interdisciplinary uh, hey, effort. Overall, this guy stopped me from coming to a public meeting. Go ahead. Let's go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so this is cohort uh, uh, meeting number one, uh, best practices in civil rights. Uh, it shows the classroom. Uh, it was very adult learning, very inter, you know, participatory, not lectures, but uh, throwing out some ideas and back and forth. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion and learning that takes place in that way. This is what the online instruction looks like. Uh, you can see all the participants can see each other, so it's not, uh, some of it is asynchronous where lectures are given, but a lot of it is the, they actually have interaction online, uh, and that works uh, extremely well, and we have, a, as you can see, a pretty sophisticated format for doing that. Uh, here's another example. Uh, th these are instructors. It's a case uh, of what the online program looks like. The students are LAPD officers or... Um Sheriff to other areas? They, uh, they are at different levels, and that's something that we're looking at for this coming year. They're all LAPD officers. Uh, some of them are more senior, some of them are more junior, and uh, that's one of the issues we're trying to work through. Uh, we thought it would be good initially to mix the levels, um, so, but um, there are certain limitations to that. The more senior officers have very different level of experience. They want to interact in a different way. We also discovered that the junior officers were hesitant to give presentations when the senior officers <laughs> were there. In fact, the capstone presentation, some of the junior officers uh, just wouldn't do their presentation because they, didn't, they saw it as, uh, mm. I don't know, possibly too risky or something like that. So we're thinking of dividing the cohorts into maybe a junior and senior cohort, which is what we do with all of the rest of our executive education. Uh, we have several other executive e education, and we do them in terms of types of experience. Um, oh, I, so we all, these logs are kept all the way through, um, and it's intended to prompt the officers to reflect on their experiences and utilize their skills. And then they share this, and then we respond to that, and then they apply it uh, in the community. Uh, the engagement process, uh, project, the capstone project, is done on this schedule. Uh, it, you know, the, we had to propose something in September. They had to actually then have a project ready by November. They implemented it then over the winter, and then they reported and did a presentation on it in, in June. We had uh, really amazing instructors. 
Uh, some of them were USC faculty, but we drew on just remarkable expertise in the broader community. And here's some examples. Uh, so, for example, Zafar is a senior advisor on civil rights and civil liberties in the Department of Homeland Security. Deborah Tull is, she's the creator of Vention Works to address the needs of schools, colleges, universities, and kind of the school environment for uh, safety in schools. Uh, Dr. Errol Southers, he's a professor in the Price School, but he's one of the world's leading experts on homegrown violent extremism. And we had 25 such people. We handpicked them. They're really remarkable individuals. So we're bringing, I think, to the education process a really uh, excellent set of experts. Uh, the first class uh, celebrated its completion on uh, June 8. And uh, we would like, uh, given the, what we see as the success of this first year, to expand the program, uh, possibly to include other uh, uh, public safety departments. Um, after you finish LAPD, please. A after we finish LAPD. Uh, and mm. given that it's largely online, we're hoping that somewhere down the road, uh, LAPD may be able to claim this as a, a national model for uh, training that focuses on reducing violence, uh, focusing on special populations, bringing a clinical as well as a nonprofit and policy uh, perspective uh, to the training, something that we feel uh, passionately is real, very important for police training. So here's some of the graduates uh, with Chief Beck just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that uh, this is something that you see as really valuable uh, for the police department. It's v enormously learning process for us uh, and a great partnership with the LA Pol uh, Police Training Academy. Uh, Commissioner, Thanks. questions, comments? How, how um, Sandy, maybe mic? I missed Speaking it, I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe I missed it, but how do you recruit how do you select the class? Uh, we do that. The Police Training Academy, working uh, with the department, actually recruits. Uh, we didn't do any of the recruitment ourselves. Uh, this was done internal to the LAPD uh, itself. Commissioner McLean Hill? Um, what is it that you learned? Uh, one of the things we learned is that the program is too long. <laughs> uh, we're uh, going to, for this next year, we're going to reduce it to six months. Uh, police officers are very, um, you know, they have demanding jobs. This is not part of their job. This is an add-on. They have to do this in addition to their full-time job. And so in terms of the feedback, uh, we, one of the things we learned is we, we need to make the program shorter. So uh, we also learned uh, that the application of this project uh, is something that we need to spend more time in developing, um, that it's been useful and valuable in some cases but we need to work more on connecting it to the, the community in a, in a, a real way because we want it to be uh, in real time that uh, they actually apply, up, apply what they're learning. Um, I think we also learned that uh, the need for this kind of training uh, and the hunger for it uh, to actually get more of a, um, uh, both a social work and a, a policy and a nonprofit understanding of how people behave, uh, how you respond, um, what kinds of agencies are there to work with you to uh, deal with that response. That all, I think, was enormously important and successful. Uh, and so um, we believe that it does change uh, we're, what we're doing, it, we do believe it does change attitudes and behavior. Uh, we uh, have now hired, uh, we've collected a lot of data on this, so we've hired a, um, an external company to do an evaluation and to give us advice on how to modify the program going forward because we take that very seriously. Uh, but in general, the, the initial evaluation was extremely uh, positive in terms of the added value 
of uh, especially understanding these populations, understanding the clinical knowledge, understanding the kind of resources that are there, and taking more of a teamwork approach to solving these issues. And I'm sorry, just one more question. You've made reference a couple of times to a social public policy, and then you said nonprofit perspective. Yeah. And so I'm clear from an academic um, engagement um, perspective about sort of what the social um, work piece of it would look like. I, I understand the policy perspective, but I've not, I'm, could you, when you well, say nonprofit, a lot of the social services that even the city government provides are done through nonprofits. And uh, those nonprofits play a very important role in mental health, uh, for example. They play a very important role in homeless. Uh, they play a very important role in child neglect. Uh, there's a whole range of nonprofits that the city contracts with and works with, and in engaging them uh, in this process, uh, having the uh, police officer more aware of that, those kinds of resources, having those resources more aware of what the police uh, are engaged with and in the community. And a lot of these nonprofits are in the community already. Uh, so it's connecting the police to the nonprofits that are as resources that are existing uh, in the community. And our school, uh, you know, we have a, a, a degree in nonprofit leadership uh, and management. We have a lot of relationships with these nonprofits. We do a lot of work in community engagement with nonprofits. And so that's a, a complementary. That's how uh, that came together. Yeah, that's, that's kind of how, how that comes together. Uh, and. You know, this is a, a real team effort with a lot of these uh, special populations. You want to involve the Department of Public Health and Mental Health uh, in, in it, you know, child services, et cetera. So it's a collaborative across the sectors, and that's something that we as a school work a lot on. And that combined with the clinical expertise of the school of social work, I think, makes this a really unique undertaking. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. I've heard nothing but really great feedback about the program, so I appreciate your coming in to um, give this report. Thank you. Um, Dean, I've got a couple of questions. On your exit interview of the um, officers, what did they learn? What's, what's their experience? How are they grading it? Are they recommending the course? Um, you're saying that you're dealing in areas that are topics that we aren't, that are complementary to what's being trained. Yeah. So some of this is new. Some of this is new to them. Um, what are they saying about it? Uh, they're saying very positive things. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, I think that's why we have such a large applicant pool for the uh, the program that we're intending to start in the fall. Uh, that is largely, I think, uh, word of mouth and the experience of the officers as well as the experience of the police tra training academy there you know the police training academy doesn't want to waste time or do things that aren't uh, valuable and complementary to what it's doing mm -hmm. but they had a very positive uh, experience with it uh, I think th the key is the kind of thing that I was just responding to is that I don't think they get this combination of uh, experts coming together uh, that take this kind of holistic team specialized approach to these populations. And I also don't think they get the kind of expertise that we're bringing to the table. Uh, we're bringing just really remarkable people uh, that we've developed relationships with over the years uh, that uh, are excited about and want to participate uh, in this program. And Almost to a person, they, uh, you know, when they gave their capstone project, uh, they saw it relevant uh, mm -hmm. to their actual on-the-ground experience uh, because that was the idea. We just didn't want this to be, you know, head knowledge or, you know, abstract. We wanted to, them to be able to take this to a particular family or a particular community. Uh, and, what you know, you can't change the trust between the officers and the community in, you know, in such a short time, but you build towards that and building these kinds of better understanding of the people that are there and the community resources that are there. I think that's the, that was the general perspective. And Does when we did the graduation, uh, there was just, uh, I thought, general enthusiasm 
okay. uh, for what we had done. My, my last question. Um, you're, you're dealing with our training uh, group that does the training of the officers. Um, do you believe that our training will be adjusted through seeing the what you're having to fill in and if they feel like some, some of that's well, necessary? Well, that's, that's one of the things we're talking about right now. Uh, you know, we had talked about training the trainers in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, we can do that to a certain extent. It's just that it's very difficult, you know, like the people I put up on the screen who are participating in this, you can't really duplicate 25 years of experience in these specialized areas by training people who are already in the, in the police department. Uh, but you can talk to them about the approach. And so, uh, Luann, um, I think over time this will, some of these elements will get into the actual training that the academy does. But in terms of the kind of people and the exposure to that external expertise, uh, I think that can't really fully be duplicated. Uh, Luann is, uh, I, I think, very enthused about what we've done, uh, thinks it's both valuable to inform what is already being done in the academy itself, but also sees it as a valuable supplement in a way that it's Thanks. hard for them to duplicate. Uh, Chief Gramala, any comments or anything you want to say about this? And we'll thank the dean for coming. I just want to thank the dean on behalf of the department for the great partnership with Dr. Pinnell. The feedback that we've heard from our side back to you, dean, has been extraordinary. Uh, we look forward to the project growing. Uh, we believe that any uh, outside um, educational component that can complement and work with ours will only build the strength of our internal training programs. So we thank you for enriching the lives uh, through this program that has already occurred, and we look forward to that in the future. Well, thank you very much. I, I do want to emphasize how important Luann uh, Pinnell was to this. Uh, she contributed a great deal to, you know, when we started, we weren't sure we knew exactly what we were uh, hoping sure. for or, or planning. Uh, we had several sessions uh, with her and her staff, and so this really was developed jointly, and great. that's what I think it makes great. it s successful and Good. exciting okay. as well. Thank so you, sir. Thank Hang you in there. Much. We've got some public comments probably. Do we have public comments on this? Yes, sir. We have three public comment cards. We have Gina DiPietro. Mr. Herman and Hamid Khan. Morning. Good morning, LAPD Commission, and good morning to Jean Jack Dot of the USC School of School Price of Public Policy. Thank you for this program. I think it's amazing. I have a challenge for you and for USC. In July, the LAPD will be initiating the Automated Field Data Report, the AFDR, which will include a report on LGBTQ and race. So we're essentially asking officers for every encounter to try and determine somebody's race and somebody's sexuality. And if you're looking at me, for example, I don't have a ring on my finger, and I'm just your average woman. I don't know what I am. Sometimes I'm really, really tan. Sometimes I'm not. It's just so tough for these officers who they think may include an additional two to four hours of paperwork. So that could mean we're taking a 10-hour beat officer away from his beat for four hours a day. So I would like it if USC were to get together with the LAPD and perhaps study the effects of that amount of paperwork and how we could perhaps um, minimize the paperwork and perhaps not ask officers to imagine somebody's sexuality or somebody's race. Because I don't know, if you look at Tommy Trojan, he's pretty bronze, he's shirtless. I don't know what he is. I, I really don't. Like, Tommy Trojan, is he Greek? Does that make him white? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's just, a, it's, your guess is as good as mine at some of these things. And since it's just starting, this is a unique opportunity for USC to get in on a get-go and see if this is really helping to improve public safety Thank or you. if taking time off of officers' beat times is actually working as a deterrent. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Mr. Herman? Uh, Dean, we just listen. We don't 
Uh, I just want to state for the record that uh, Michael Hunt, the Red Chief back there, is being uh, retaliated by one of your officers, Diaz, and he's requesting okay, that on Mr. T. Fank Mr., um, speak with him. Okay, let me get on to topic. For the record, sir, here you go. For the record, dealing with people with mental health is not a police situation. To de-escalate any situation of bad enforcement, and I remind you, Chancellor from USC, and don't get me wrong, cadets shouldn't be fucked by police. However, extremism violence is an issue as brought up about sex, crimes against children. However, Pilot Sucks, which is your program, as I heard, bias, LAPD, and prejudice policing. <coughs> Do you understand that? It's very clear. 42 USC 1983 is what I'm exhibiting to you, sir, today, for the record. Under the Ralph M. Brown Act, 54950 to 54963 ETSEQ. Because we have a political machine here called LAPD, and these 88 applicants are from LAPD. Bias, prejudice, and racist. You should include anyone interested outside of the department so that different points of view come together as opposed to one point of view. Fuck the police, NWA. That's why we had the Compton rap singers tell us and say to us the sole history of NWA, and I appreciate that. I never liked rap up until today, up until yesterday, up until Michael Hunt was being threatened by police today and asked to leave. Needs to stop. Stop fucking with people. Reflective, NWA, excessive force, mental health, and Hamid Khan, please. You can stay for the rest of the meeting if you'd like to, Dean. <laughs> we'll go till about 2 o'clock. It's up I to you. Catch a plane. Go ahead. <laughs> Can you start the clock again? Yeah. So here, Bob, here we are again, a, uh, an example of uh, how things are shaping and reshaping themselves, uh, this gentleman from USC. Uh, we have to be very, very skeptical, uh, skeptical and careful about how these things are presented. Knowing the history of the academia, knowing the deep complicity of the academia and the oppression of our people, knowing how about eugenics, knowing about all these interdisciplinary things that we have seen over time, this is another example and a veneer that is being created to, to, to just kind of lead us down this path that is getting a stamp of approval from the academia. We have clear examples of how, for example, the complicity of USC, which is a major recipient of Department of Homeland Security, which has contributed majorly into the creation of surveillance apparatus and the stalker state that we always talk about. We are very aware of the UC system, the deep complicity of University of California, particularly, and we'll probably be going to be hearing, hopefully one of these days, uh, next month, on data-driven evidence-based policing. We see the complexity of how UCLA, UC Santa Cruz, UCI is engaged in this thing. So when you have somebody uh, uh, with the title of a dean uh, speaking about it, and we don't know where the money came from because this program is driven, is run by a gift from somewhere. We don't know who that gift, the, that gift is from. Um, we also have to look at the amount of money that is, being, that is being looked at. So I think just be very, very careful. Be very skeptical about listening to these things because now we are in this era because nowhere you will hear him speak about or there even their knowledge that what is the operational process of these cops. You talk about dealing with subsets of population, they'll use this language of special population. Who is that special population? How is that population being de decontextualized? What is their experiences? How are they being targeted? How are they being stalked? That is not going to be a, con a piece of conversation. This is a parachuting in, a top-down approach of continuing. Okay, do we have any other speakers on this? We have no other speakers, sir. Okay. Dean, thank you, sir. Yep. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thanks for... We're now in item number 2B, verbal presentation and discussion relative to the 2017 Use of Force Year-End Review Report. You can use mine. I have all my notes written out. Seriously, I have all my notes written out. Dean, if you look to your left, you'll see seven officers that would like to take your chair. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to turn this, uh, this portion over to uh, Commissioner Johnson to begin. <laughs> Good morning. Um, so I've now had the opportunity to read the entire report, which I, again I note is over, almost 400 pages. Once again, I want to applaud the authors of the report. Uh, specifically, Captain John McMahon, Sergeant Robert Von Voigt, Officers Jens Beck, and Officer Ryan Gonzalez. Uh, I want to, th Chief Beck's not here today, but I want to thank his leadership uh, in really directing the department to make this report, frankly, far more comprehensive than I had ever envisioned. Um, this is much more than a report on use of force, it's really a comprehensive overview of our department and our commitment to, to quality through continuous improvement. There's just an immense amount of really, really great and helpful information in this report. Chief Beck's uh, statement on page nine really sets out the vision for the department and, and what our overall vision is and the, that the commission shares with regard to use of force. And if nothing else, I encourage people to read that. And the first part of the book is, is an executive summary, and there's just an amazing amount of encapsulated information there. But really, there, there's just a ton of really useful and helpful information in the report. When, when we originally talked about doing a report like this, it was, it was really because uh, the, they thought to use it as a tool to guide um, how we look at what we're doing. Uh, to look at what's occurring, what's working, what's not working, and what we need to improve. So I have a few observations. Some of these observations are a little bit repetitive with what, uh, with what was discussed last week, and then I have a few specific things I'd like us to dig a little deeper on. Um, so as, as was noted two weeks ago, categorical use of force incidents and officer-involved shootings in particular make up a tiny, tiny percentage of citizen officer contacts. And the, uh, the illustration on page 56 and 57 really do a good job of illustrating just how infrequent these events are. Another striking number to me was the fact that 6,555 firearms were taken from suspects in 2017. Uh, that's a huge number of weapons. These were not gun buybacks. These were weapons taking off, taken off of suspects in enforcement activities. That was an 11% increase from 2016. So it shows that our officers are, are even more fully engaged on, on taking weapons off of the street. When you compare that to the number of OIS, officer-involved shooting incidents, you see that in most of these situations, the vast majority of these incidents, these situations, the, the officers were able to resolve these in a nonviolent way. The other thing I think that is important to remember is that in almost a quarter, 23% of the officer involved shootings, the suspect fired at the officers or other individuals during the incident. So we can't lose sight about how dangerous police work is and that the officers, of course, have a right to defend their own lives and an obligation to defend the lives of others. Another striking but not surprising number in the report was the influence of meth. Uh, in 42% of the officer-involved shootings, the uh, involved individual had, uh, had, had a presence of meth in their system. Uh, and that same percentage, 42%, holds true for alcohol also. So uh, drugs, alcohol, um, are, are an influencing factor into who's getting involved in these situations. The other not surprising but um, 
sad fact is the number of individuals with mental illness involved in officer involved shootings. And that number more than tripled from four in 2016 to 13 last year. And for me, it highlights our need to continue our mental health training. There are some specific areas in this report that I believe bear further analysis. Um, I'll provide this list to you in writing so you don't have to take notes. Uh, and what I would like to do is agendize this for our next use of force subcommittee meeting, uh, which involves the inspector general's office, two commissioners, and the department to do a deeper dive on these, on these uh, specific matters so we can uh, hopefully take some lessons away from them. And I think, Mr. Tfank, we have our next meeting scheduled for July, is it 16th? 17th, sir. July 17th. So. Uh, no, that is uh, not open to the public. But what I would, what uh, once we, I'm, and I'm not, I think there's a lot here to dive into um, that I'll get into in a minute. What I would suggest is uh, it'll probably take more than one meeting, but then there'll be a report that will be made back to the full commission and to the public uh, once we are able to go through these through these issues. So here are the specific issues that I would like us to delve deeper into. One uh, surprising fact, frankly, was that other similarly sized agencies, New York, Chicago, Houston, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department and Philadelphia, also all saw significant decreases in the number of officer involved shootings from 2016 to 2017 while we had a 10% increase. So once again, I'd like to take a look at what these other departments are doing to see if there's anything we can learn from them. So much of our new training and equipment from de-escalation training to equip, equipping our officers with tasers and better use of uh, beanbag shotguns and 40 millimeter launchers is specifically, at, specifically targeted at peacefully resolving situations where we have individuals that are not armed with a firearm. Yet 34% of our officer involved shootings in 2017 involved individuals armed with weapons other than a firearm. And that's more than double the number from last year. This was also our second highest year in the last five years uh, in, in terms of situations with individuals not armed with a firearm. So according, I, what I'd like to do is do a specific review of the facts and circumstances of each of those 15 officer-involved shootings. It's a, it's a somewhat finite number. It's 15, so I think we can do uh, a deeper dive into those. Um, and, of course, we already have the reports uh, done that we used in, in looking at our um, when we adjudicated those cases. There were also seven officer-involved shootings which resulted from pre-planned activities in 2017. In 2016, that number was three, as it was in 2015, and that number was one in 2014. Uh, given that by definition, these incidents afforded the officers greater opportunity to plan and coordinate, I'd also like to do a, a specific review of those, the facts and circumstances on those seven cases uh, to see if we can learn something from them to either modify our tactics or planning in those incidents. Another fact uh, that was apparent and uh, that, frankly, again, having research done like this, it really highlights it, and you, you wouldn't necessarily know otherwise, was the significant spike in the number of rounds fired overall in officer-involved shootings in 2017. There were 487 total rounds fired in 2017. That number was 194 in 2016. That is a very, very large jump. Uh, so, again, I'd like the department to, to do some uh, look into why that was and if there were, I know that I can think of at least one incident in particular where there was an excessive number of rounds fired, um, but really what is underlying that number. Likewise, we also saw a significant spike in the number of rounds fired per incident. That number was 11.1 .1 in 2017 versus 4.9 in 2016. So again, that's, a, that's well more than doubling the number uh, from 2016. So I would also like the department to take a look at that. Uh, in a related issue, the use of, 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 of rifle, of, of using our rifles skyrocketed 
in 2017. There were 213 rounds fired from rifles in 2017. That number was 13 in 2016, seven in 2005, and 73 in 2014. I can't even put a percentage on that increase. So not only do I wanna look at the incidents where we're using rifle, I think we also have to revisit our policy on when using a rifle is, uh, is appropriate. So I would like to take a look at that. And lastly, there were nine incidents incidences in 2017 where there were more than four shooters in an officer involved shooting four four or more there were zero such incidents in 2016 and only two in 2014 and 2015. this for me raises uh, issues about command and control and whether or not we uh, are um, properly determining who necessarily needs to be shooting, who needs to be on left lethal, uh, et cetera. So on those nine incidences where we had four or more shooters involved, I want to uh, do a deeper dive into the facts and circumstances around those incidences as well. Uh, so again, um, uh, thank you for the report. Uh, really a fantastic job, a lot of helpful information there. And uh, I think it gives us a blueprint of how we can take that information and hopefully glean um, some greater insights from it. And I look forward to our meeting in just a few weeks to, to start that work. Yeah, let me add to, uh, to Commissioner Johnson's um, comments. Um, the book is the facts. And interpretation of the facts is important. But most important is that you're putting out the facts by themselves without interpretation. And I think that uh, what Commissioner Johnson has brought up is certain areas that pop, that um, require some sort of exp um, either an explanation or better than that, um, a hard look at um, uh, uh, are there certain things that need to be changed or modified? Or maybe these are outlier events. We don't know, we'll find out. But my, quest my question to you, so, who did that? Who was that? Because I just want to tell you that that's your last warning. Um, um, if there are things that Commissioner Johnson didn't bring up, things that you, in, in, in spending the time, I mean, I, I, um, I read it as well, similar things popped up to me, but there may be other things that you think also um, should be uh, looked at in the same light and at the same time frame. Feel free to add. Um, I think that uh, the public can feel free to contact us as well on, sp on specifics. And, uh, but as far as a, f um, a factual document, um, uh, very well done, very well done. Commissioner McLean Hill. A um, couple things. Uh, first, uh, I think that Commissioner Johnson was, as per usual, incredibly thorough with respect to his um, review and also the things that he highlighted that are deserving of addi attention, additional attention. In particular, I do want to underscore um, that what popped out for me um, also related to the number of incidences where you had um, multiple officers involved in OISs, and in particular where you had a high number of officers, number of rounds, um, and uh, uh, I, I didn't focus, but should have on the use of, uh, of rifles as well. So I'm, I'm e extremely interested in um, looking at very carefully, um, not just uh, from a policy perspective, but also as applied, uh, how we are um, approaching situations where uh, force may be warranted, um, but still, approaching those situations in a manner that is um, uh, likely to result in the least amount of force necessary to achieve the objective. So I, I think that's uh, an important thing and I just wanted to, to, to underscore um, and to, uh, to you know, indicate my total agreement with the areas that will be <laughs> further investigated um, by the use of force policy or the use of force um, subcommittee in collaboration with the department and the IG's office. 
uh, I also and uh, you know don't spend a lot of time um, you know stroking other commissioners or the department for that matter but um, I do think it's critical to uh, you know to again acknowledge the uh, result of focus and um, you know and hard work because uh, this kind of uh, a report does provide uh, a level of transparency that is unprecedented uh, in terms of both its um, comprehensiveness and the presentation, which makes it very accessible. Um, we can debate for um, a very long time what it actually represents, how it's to be interpreted, but um, right. the, the, the actual uh, leadership uh, you know, from Commissioner Johnson and the uh, the department's uh, willingness to take this on um, is uh, is something that is is quite notable and does make a difference. So, thank you all for getting this to this point. Thank you, uh, Chief Grimala. Comments, thoughts. Uh, again, to uh, Captain McMahon and your entire team and everyone who contributed to that document, uh, our thanks from the entire uh, command staff as well. I think um, it highlights as well the importance of the de-escalation training and the actual effectiveness of it throughout 2017 and, and clearly as we move into 2018. Um, and by the same token, it highlights the challenges of the men and women of the department each and every day. As Commissioner Johnson spoke of the gun recoveries, the amount of potential confrontations that ex exist out there on a daily basis. We all, as we receive our messaging throughout the day, um, see those incidents that could have ended um, in some type of peril, either for an officer or for a community member, uh, looking at uh, shooting victims 20.7% fewer year to date even compared to 2017. So I think when we look at your report in the context of the daily work of the men and women of the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, it gives us a renewed appreciation uh, for that work, the challenges of it, and again, our commitment to further improvement. So I thank you. Um, do we have any public comments on item number 2B? Yes, sir. We have five common cards. Okay. We have Mr. Herman, Adam Smith, Jonathan Foster. You can go ahead. Mr. F is it Foster? Go ahead, sir. Uh, I definitely wish the use of force wasn't needed and only the people and interactions uh, that required use of forces who, who were dealing who we're talking about and uh, we're dealing with a thing called interpersonal anger people have an interpersonal anger they carry around and they willed out on someone and then you get a call and then their interpersonal anger is now directed at the police department and uh, some of my other thoughts here I put down was that uh, really one of the untalked about police approaches of how to get everyone uh, uh, out of these issues is to deal with the substance abuse. And uh, to get everybody off the sugar, the caffeine, the cigarettes, the alcohol, the pot, the meth, the coke, the heroin, and 6 to 20 prescription drugs, and then maybe you won't have quite a problem. So how do we address getting people off sugar, caffeine, cigarettes, alcohol, pot, coke, heroin, meth, and six to 20 prescription drugs so that your job isn't as hard as it is. Um, and uh, so much of this that takes place is not the police. It's, it's on the very narrow part of the society that won't put their weapons down. That's the real problem. Put your weapon down. Put your weapon down. Put, they don't put it down. Sir, miss, sir, miss, put your weapon down. Drop the weapon. Put the weapon down. Dro They're not dropping the weapon. Maybe it's the cigarettes, the pot, the coke, the alcohol, the interpersonal anger that God is supposed to be dealing with. We're talking about ungodly people. Like As I said, as this is the most narrow thing. 
is do what God said. And then I know people need guns. I wish everybody had a gun, but they didn't shoot. So get off the drugs, please. Mr. Herman, please. So we see we have issues around 42 USC 12101 ET.SEQ. slash to 12132. And let's take a scenario about the Baltimore Police Department that used a history of excessive force against people with mental health, people with disabilities like Brother Africa, people with disabilities like the poor gentleman out in Santa Monica, people with disabilities like the gentleman by the name of Ezel Ford, not to mention a woman who was strangled for whatever purpose or reason, we do not understand where the 22 fucking minutes are. But the issue here is how to safeguard the American report on what? Title VI, violation of police enforcement critical. Let's deal with Safe Street Act, federal mandate, stop fucking what people in their communities. Excessive force. 42 USC 1983. I have to repeat it so I don't get my fucking mouth stapled to shut the fuck up. Because even in my time of fucking madness, I can stand right here with a smile and say I love you to fucking death. Clarence Brandenburg versus who other than Ohio. Fuck Ohio and fuck the KKK. See, who's fucking crazy? LAPD is fucking crazy with all your training, all your sophistication, and yet you want to fuck children. Yet you want to fuck Next speaker, please. I've got four seconds. Fuck Next. you, Soberoff. Adam Smith. Mr. Smith. There's obviously a lot to talk about with this giant report. Um... Every officer now has a body-worn video, right? Every patrol car has a dash cam. But as we know from Eric Rivera's murder in 2017 and from half the patrol cars in South L.A. in 2013, officers can decide not to use these without penalty. In 2015, Mr. Soberoff is quoted as saying, The combination of in-car video and on-body camera is so protective of the public that it's very exciting. Um, but if there's no requirement for these officers to actually use this equipment. I just, I, yeah. Commissioner Johnson, you talked about, you know, the more bullets per shooting, the more shooters per shooting. Um, meth and alcohol being present, like further criminalizing these people that are dead that have no chance to defend themselves. But you're not talking about Eric Rivera. You're not talking about Jesse Murillo. What does the Police Protective League have in terms of testing the officers that are doing these killings? Are they being tested for meth or for alcohol? Mr. Soberoff, you're talking about facts without interpretation. When you talk about being armed without a firearm, that is interpretation. Because what, you know, what you're talking about being armed with is an interpretation. When Jesse Morello was killed in December, all the papers reported that he had this spiked, some spiked pole. And then the next week here, Chief Beck said it was some kind of crowbar or something. So it is interpretation. It is what you decide a weapon is and what that officer decides a weapon is. And what an officer depends, decides what being attacked is. Like when Dr. Abdullah got arrested here a few weeks ago, could that officer say, I was being attacked, so that prompted my use of force? You guys are complicit in all of this. Next speaker. Valerie Rivera. Followed by General Jeff. Okay, so just hearing this report has made my heart pound out of my chest. Um, for all you that are sitting here talking about this report and for everybody that wrote on this report, um, I am the mother of Eric Rivera. Um, he was killed on June 6th. He is that one person in the report that got that headshot to the head. Um, 
11 rounds were shot at him. Seven of them actually hit him with that one bullet to the head. Um, and just like Adam spoke right now about did those two officers that killed Eric, I don't even want to call them officers because they're not officers and their jobs are going to be taken away here pretty soon. Believe that. <clears throat> did they get drug tested right after? I want to know that. I want to know if they got drug tested because they should have. Because, you know, any other job, if they get hurt on the job, they get, that person gets drug tested. And these are officers. That officer that jumped out of his car, that failed to put the car in park and tripped on his own damn two feet and hit himself on the ground with his elbow, talking about he was in excruciating pain, why didn't he get drug tested? Because I know he didn't. Um, you know, it... it yeah, 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 right back to work the next day. Um, I'm going to fight hard, and I'm working hard. Best believe that. I got God on my side. God comes with me everywhere I go. God gives me the words, the wisdom, and the strength to keep on going and fight for my son. And I want all of you all to know that God is at work right now. He's at work right now. And changes are coming. My son's going to get his justice. So you guys could sit here and fight against it. You guys could sit here and make it difficult for me. Shame on all of you for that. Because my son was not supposed to die like that. So just know God's at work. Would you like to take your public comment time now? Sure. sure okay. Sure. Go ahead. <clears throat> It's just such a shame that you all know, you all know those officers messed up. And it's such a shame that those officers can't even man up and admit to it. It's simple. Man up. Say, I fucked up. I apologize. And just so you all know, my son had a squirt gun in the middle of June on a summer day. A neon green squirt gun. How the fuck can a cop sit there and say that he thought it was a semi-automatic? They work with guns 24-7. They've been, wor what, one cop has been working, what, 15 years? The other cop has been working eight years? And you're telling me they can't distinguish a fucking semi-automatic to a squirt gun? And besides that, it doesn't even matter at this point. Because what matters is that that cop jumped out of his car, failed to put it in park, not giving my son any chance to even speak to them. In a matter of seconds, my son was being shot down and ran over with their police car. And why? Because the cop tried to jump back in, and instead of stepping on the brake, he accidentally steps on the gas. <laughs> and still has a job. Still can go home and see their kids. See, their wife, when my baby's life is gone now, and I'm left here to suffer and fight every day. I'm actually working harder than those two bastard-ass cops because I'm fighting for justice. I'm fighting for something that's right. And I hope one day, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to start going out there and cop-watching myself now. Actually, tonight's going to be my first night to go out to Harbor Division and start cop-watching Wilmington and San Pedro. And I hope to God I run into them officers one day so I could sit there and Thank ask you. them Thank some you. questions. Thank you. General Jeff. Morning, Jeff. Morning, sir. General Jeff Skid Row. Um... This commission is uh, appointed citizens that represent we the people, and I'm still trying to figure out uh, what fact-checking metrics did this commission apply to validate any of this data that this, uh, this, this so-called report has put forth. Um, just because it's comprehensive doesn't make it true. You all are accepting this like it's absolute truth. I don't know how can we ch tell whether LAPD is lying or not. I don't know. They're not above board. They're not gods. They're not saints. 
if there's good cops and bad cops, there's a potential on the looking on the bad cop angle. There's a potential for a whole lot of deceit in this report. What fact checking is this commission doing to prove what are your uh, what are your algorithms? What are your fact checking met metrics? How do we know that you're holding them accountable? Sure, you read over four, a little over 400 pages. Just because you read it, you accepted it as absolute truth. There's a whole lot of discrepancies in here. For instance, right here on page 19, you know, I spoke to this before about the cultural competency that's insensitive, the fact that you have all these suspects in silhouettes that look like black people. Matter of fact, one of them even got a black hat on. And then you have an officer on the bottom of the page, a much larger, you know, officer like that, supposed to be subliminal messaging. But why is his silhouette white? You know, there's racial undertones into this. That alone is insensitive. I mean, I could swing through this whole thing. But I mean, just because it's, oh, a whole lot of charts and data and graphs and numbers, that doesn't make it true. You represent us. What are you guys doing to, to ensure us? What are your methods? What are your methods? What are your fact-checking metrics? We have no idea. You say, oh, this is cute. It's a cute report. Oh, it's so comprehensive. Oh, it's leading the nation. Oh, oh, oh. that's worthless to us. You know, our people are dying. You got Valerie Rivera here crying in tears, and you're putting forth this weak document. Tell us wh what your metrics are. And we have no other comment cards for this item, sir? Okay. Um, let's go to items um, C. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners. Um, C, F, and G, I don't believe that we have any um, commissioner comments or require a report unless somebody wants to. No, I, I don't think we need a report okay. on those items. And then uh, uh, may, we, do we have any public comments on items 2, C, F, or G? C, F, and G. Yeah. We have Mr. Herman on all three. And that's it? That's it. Okay, Mr. Herman. This is 2, C, 2, F, and 2, G. Okay, this is item 2C regarding fees for special services. And yet speechless, symbolic. How do we enforce special services for the police commissioners? Is it by respect or is it by special fees? Well, the executive directors don't have any idea what respect services are established by this board. Their recommendations, as brought out by General Jeff, and he's right, bias, prejudice, and disgusting. In addition to approve executive director's report and transmit a city administrative officer for the purpose only? What the fuck language does that mean? Because I speak English, and I want to know. All of us want to know. What the fucking executive director report is pointing out set forth for recommendation to approve executive director's report when we are the legislative body here. We appoint people. As General Jeff pointed out, we the people are the legislative body. You're off topic. And we shall correct topic. any Brown Act violations as you bring forth. Last What's morning. the next item, sir? Let's go to let's go to number F. I thought you said I had D. D for no. dummy. No, F? Yeah, you have, uh, so you're done with C, so let's start with F. F for flunky. It has to do um, with, with the Hyatt. amendment to... Deals with the Hyatt. Ben Hyatt. Certified disposition. Reporters. For court reporter. And, and, and Lyndon J. Okay. And Associates. LLC Armando Herman. Incidentally, though, as you all know, the request of approval on Third Amendment does not exist. For you, the people here today, we represent the First Amendment, capital F-I-R-S-T, in regards, in addition to complicating this issue, under the Third Amendment. But again, 
constitutional law is what we protect. That's why we're fighting Jewish people here. Off topic. Want what? To to, want to go to the next one now? Or want to... How could I be off topic, sir? How could I be off topic? Easy. <laughs> you're great at it. Why? Because I said Jew? I'm a white nigger. What's wrong with you? Okay, so you're a off Jew? topic again. So now let's go to number G. Let's start the clock again. Number G has to do with the ABC grant award acceptance. More alcohol beverages. Where do we need more alcohol? We need more alcohol at the Inland Empire restaurant. DBA doing business as the Spearmint Rhino in CD6. Off topic, last warning. I'm not off topic. I'm talking about an award for alcohol beverages and control, sir. I'm dealing with a grant application, which we will discuss tomorrow at 1 p.m. during those reports on the claims. So I'm not off topic. I'm dealing with the board action. I am the board. I am the goddamn board. And I will make an action in objection to appeal any decision made okay. in the department's report to transmit fucking currently to that off, fucking off mayor. Can we have a motion to approve items number 2C, I'll move 2F, items 2C, and 2G? F and G. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, let's move to the chief's report. We have, no, no, we have items 2D. 2D and E. Oh, I'm sorry. We're in item 2D, okay, Inspector 2D. General's report dated June 14, 2018, relative to the review of the Los Angeles Police Department's jail and holding tank structures and procedures. Good morning, Commissioners. This is Mark Smith, Inspector General. Uh, about a year and a half ago, and in the aftermath of the death of Ms. Waukesha Wilson inside an LAPD jail facility, this commission directed the Office of Inspector General to report on department policies and procedures within its jails to look for trends or recurrent issues that can be improved upon specifically as they're related to deaths inside LAPD jail facilities and to, to uh, develop a more suitable review and adjudication procedure for these incidents. Another way that I have tended to think about our objective and, and our approach uh, to this report is to help identify and pursue any meaningful steps toward minimizing the chance of someone dying while being detained in a department facility. A number of OIG staff members worked toward this critical objective and put together a very detailed report including a series of substantive recommendations. To its credit, the department has reacted openly and favorably to these recommendations. And as my staff has told me, that's the case really throughout the process of our gathering information and working with them in, in reaching these recommendations. They have also already initiated a number of efforts in accordance with our recommendations. I briefly mentioned a number of OIG staff members who contributed to this report, which I consider very important. I want to quickly recognize them for their efforts. They include police special investigators, Jonathan Ota, Sam Kalina, and Daisy, Al Daisy Alarcon, all of whom are present here today, as well as James Robinson, who is a former OIG employee. Um, with that, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Mr. Ota from our office, who's prepared to take you through the report, its recommendations, and also some of the actions already uh, underway on the part of the department. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Jonathan Oda, Special Investigator with the Office of the Inspector General. Uh, this review began with a very open and honest discussion uh, between the members of our team and the leadership from Office of Special Operations and Custody Services Division. Uh, the department was very encouraging of this review from the beginning and stated their appreciation for any forthcoming uh, recommendations for improvement early on. Uh, it's important to note here that the Department of CSD had already begun to make uh, some improvements to jail operations even before our review began. And during the course of this review, as we relayed concerns to the leadership at CSD, uh, they quickly began making changes necessary to resolve uh, some of those issues. Having said that, what I will do uh, in as brief amount of time as possible here is to overview the four main components uh, of our review, which were number one, facility inspections and structural improvements. Number two, our review of the intake procedures, which includes an evaluation of the housing classification process. Uh, our review of the documentation and review of suicides and suicide attempts. Can you turn this microphone up, and finally, sorry about that. Uh, number four, uh, creating a, our, our creation of a new adjudication protocol specifically designed for in-custody deaths that occur within the jails uh, and the holding tanks. 
uh, the police station holding tanks. Um, before I jump into the first of the main components, uh, I would like to state that uh, we approached this review with the understanding that suicides and suicide attempts, while extremely unfortunate in nature, cannot always be prevented. So our goal uh, was to identify areas of improvement for the LAPD jails and station holding tanks in order to decrease the number of deaths and attempts uh, each year. For facility inspections and structural modifications, our first step in preparing for those inspections was to thoroughly review all in custody death and suicide attempts uh, that occurred or were adjudicated from 2012 through 2016. Our objective was to identify reoccurring themes and issues in these incidents uh, to get a better understanding of what we would be looking for uh, in terms of our facility inspections uh, and a review of the intake process. One of the more common trends that our office identified looked closely at, uh, when we looked closely at suicide and suicide attempts were those by hanging. Um, not only were they significant in number, but they involved anchor points that we felt upon further inspection would likely be able to be eliminated uh, again in order to um, affect our desire to decrease the number of deaths and attempts each year. So to be as thorough as possible and to determine how prevalent uh, these issues were firsthand, we inspected all of the jail cells and all of the police station holding tanks in the entire department. That included 435 jail cells, as well as 113 police station holding tanks. Um, Just a- Yes, sir. We have, um, and at how many stations do we have jails? We have, uh, uh, do we have jails? We there, have there jails are 10, that are being the, occupied. Correct, there are 10 jails uh, operated by the police department. Okay. Five of them are currently open. Five of them are temporarily closed. Uh, and 21 stations, each of them have police station holding tanks that are separate and distinct from jails. So some of the jails are adjacent to, connected to police stations, uh, but the distinction between jail cells and holding tanks is important Correct. because of the fact um, that jails are under the authority of Office of Special Operations, whereas the police station holding tanks and the police stations are under the authority of the Office of Operations. And, and of the five that are closed, um, is Harbor the only one that has never been opened after it's been built, or are there others? To my knowledge, that is correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no. no. Um, in addition to anchor points, we also made sure to capture other aspects of uh, the cells that may contribute uh, to a lack of inmate safety, such as adequacy of lighting, presence of telephones, video cameras, and intercoms. Uh, tying in some of our inspection results with uh, some of the reoccurring th uh, circumstances noted in our review of the in-custody deaths and attempted uh, suicide incidents, we found that 32% of uh, all jail cells contained at least one telephone. We confirmed uh, in the inspections that 229 out of the 435 uh, jail cells did not have video cameras inside at the time of the inspection, and that 45 of the 100 113 station holding tanks did not have video cameras. Uh, as the report states, the video camera issue was of concern to us, especially because of the fact that if you don't have a camera inside the cell, it is difficult, if not impossible, to have a direct visual observation of those inmates outside of the inmate safety checks that are required twice an hour for the jails. Um, there are no such uh, uh, regulations or laws holding the police station uh, holding tanks to have to perform those um, inmate safety checks. Um, however, I would like to note that since our inspections, cameras have been installed in each of the cells at MDC, Metropolitan Detention Center, which is the largest of the three regional jails. Um, that improvement significantly changes the percentage and the total number of cells uh, without cameras. Um, additionally, as of our last meeting with the department, uh, CSD was on the verge of replacing all corded telephones with cordless telephones, uh, which would eliminate uh, that common anchor point. Excuse me. Uh, for the intake review portion uh, of our um, of our review, our team moved um, to look at uh, the classification process more closely as well as the general uh, intake process at the three regional jails, MDC, Valley, and 77th. We were particularly interested in how the intake process uh, identified and gathered information about the mental health uh, issues that each arrestee and inmate may have. 
Um, we were also very interested in how the decision was made that determines uh, where arrestees are housed during confinement, which is the process known as housing and classification. Uh, we determined early on that the fact-gathering portion of the intake process where arresting officers and CSD personnel will ask very personal questions uh, to the arrestees coming into the jails um, required some improvement by way of guaranteeing some privacy. Um, although they are not always asked these questions in the presence of others, uh, it was not uncommon to do so. This was obviously important to us because of the fact that the eventual analysis can only be as consistently accurate as the information that you are um, given to evaluate. Uh, and the department um, acknowledged that and uh, as of our last meeting had been um, brainstorming ways in order to ensure that, that privacy uh, for those conversations and those questions. Um, the communication barrier portion of the intake process, what we, what we felt were communication barriers, um, concerns about the consistency of the information relayed from arresting officers and medical staff at the jails to the processing officers who eventually decide the uh, housing classification. Um, with regard to arresting officers, um, we were told that although they often relay circumstances of arrest, um, uh, any observations they may have of the arrestee while in the field and before coming to the jail, that that conversation um, did not always occur. And we wanted to make sure not only that it occurred consistently, but um, preferably that it be documented um, in writing. Um, from our perspective, it is invaluable for the processing officer to know in detail those, those circumstances of the arrest, any kind of behaviors or statements that the arrestee might have made in transit or in the field, um, if they are being overly aggressive, uh, especially withdrawn, things of this nature will have um, a heavy impact on the ultimate uh, determination for housing classification. Uh, and uh, the same goes for uh, communication between the medical staff and um, the processing officers uh, in custody services division. Um, our team was surprised by the lack of communication uh, between medical staff and processing officer. We were informed early on that the only information relayed between the two was at the bottom of, uh, I believe, the currently used inmate classification questionnaire. It is under revision right now, but uh, the last we knew, um, it was still being in use. The uh, particular version of the inmate classification questionnaire is the one that has the record of medical screening at the bottom. It is uh, check boxes with no area to explain the reason for checking those boxes. They mainly have to do with preferences for how the arrestee is eventually housed. Um, there was a desire expressed uh, on behalf of the CSD personnel that they get more information from medical staff, but the reason that we were told um, for that lack of communication were, uh, was because of HIPAA protections. Uh, so HIPAA obviously being a, um, a protection for medical information without uh, authorized consent to share. Uh, our office looked at HIPAA. There are some sections with clear exceptions to uh, the HIPAA disclosure, and we believe uh, in those exceptions, uh, there are a few that relate directly to law enforcement um, activity and specifically to um, uh, jails and uh, correctional facilities, such as the LAPD jails. And so we believe that there is some room there to have a better communication, more conversation about um, any observances uh, of behavior statements made or any other um, details that may come up in the medical examination. Uh, the, the medical staff are in an especially good position to be able to make those observations and relay that information uh, to the processing officers and the CSD staff who are responsible for making the housing classification decision. Uh, as to housing classification specifically, uh, the ultimate decision, as stated, um, is up to the processing officer at the jail booking window and the assigned supervisor who will review that decision. Uh, the OIG was informed early on that the decision is made without any formal system to ensure a thorough evaluation uh, of the documents and communications in a uniform manner for each arrestee. According to the jail operation manual, the processing officer is to review and evaluate the county medical form, which is filled out for each arrestee upon uh, entering the jail, as well as the inmate classification questionnaire, the booking approval, and any other pre-booking documents. Um, from our observations, this is a large amount of information to evaluate before making this decision, uh, and that list does not include the observations that we just spoke of. Uh, from the arresting officers um, going forward, hopefully from the medical staff, 
as well as any observations made by the processing officers themselves. Uh, the OAG has a great appreciation for the work experience and expertise of the detention officers working at CSD. However, a full evaluation of all these factors, uh, we believe, is a great burden to place on any one person in these circumstances, especially without some type of clear guidance and support. Um, and that is considering especially the time constraints uh, of the situation. It also came to light in the context of incorporating mental health status of an arrestee into this evaluation that none of the medical personnel working in the dispensaries uh, are licensed to perform mental health evaluations of arrestees or inmates. Can you hold for a second? Yes. Mr. Herman, you're disrupting the meeting. Um, this is your final warning. Your actions, your, uh, um, uh, um, the gestures you're making. So that's your final warning. I don't need to explain myself. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, as I was saying, it was we were informed by the City of Los Angeles Medical Services Division, who supplies um, the staff for the medical dispensaries in the jail. Uh, they do not have licensed uh, professionals there to perform mental health evaluations. They can probe suicidal tendencies if needed, or examine uh, mental health issues to decide if an inmate needs to be taken uh, to a non-LAPD facility for treatment. Um, however, that capability is not there. Uh, this is an extremely important function that both our office and the department, um, and, and I believe medical services division from the city believe is, is necessary to have in the jails. I know that uh, uh, telepsychiatry was discussed as, as a possible option. It was in the research phase during, um, during our review. Um, but as of right now, that does not exist uh, in the jail. So until the desired uh, psychiatric care can be obtained, it is all the more important for CSD personnel to be provided with all the tools necessary to use the information that is available uh, for each arrestee to the fullest extent in terms of the housing classification determination. Um, and just to repeat, that is uh, the reason why we believe a more formal system, um, something involving a documentation justifying the ultimate classification um, is, is necessary. Uh, the third uh, component, suicide and attempt reviews and documentation, it was equally important for the OIG to understand the policies and procedures involved in the documentation and review of all in-custody deaths and suicide attempts in both the jails and station holding tanks. Uh, from our perspective, if recurring issues are to be readily identified or if preventative measures uh, are to be enacted, the incidents must be properly documented and post-incident reviews uh, must be conducted on a regular basis. Our team had very productive meetings with CSD uh, on the specific subject of suicide attempts. It was acknowledged that both the documentation of suicide attempts in the jails and the reviews of all such incidents could be improved. Uh, I think we came to the conclusion that some easy fixes, so to speak, uh, would entail documenting suicide attempts on separate and official LAPD forms um, instead of using currently uh, the morning reports. Um, and to make those documents more accessible for uh, review after the incidents. Um, we uh, also discussed with them, and, and, and it was agreed that there would be uh, a regular routine of reviews for all attempts, uh, attempted suicides that occurred uh, in the jails. Uh, we believe that the police station holding tanks uh, should also develop similar policies that require the same level of documentation um, and review as the jails. Um, again, going towards the purpose of identifying trends and uh, creating preventative measures as needed. Uh, finally, uh, adjudication uh, was the last component um, of our review. It was a significant portion, I believe, of, of the Commission's objective, um, and the reason being is because the current adjudication process for in-custody deaths, which are categorical uses of force, um, includes a review of tactics involved, uh, appropriateness of the drawing or exhibiting of a weapon and the force used and uh, the issue identified by this board and our office was that for many in custody deaths that occur within these facilities um, there is no force used and or, or weapons drawn um, for many of the cases uh, additionally many of the incidents occur without uh, CSD personnel being directly responsible such that they are not considered substantially involved employees and their tactics would not then uh, be reviewed uh, or evaluated uh, for eight of the 19 in custody deaths that we reviewed from 2012 through 2016 the adjudication had no findings and uh, listed the outcome as does not apply so to rectify this issue we developed the proposed adjudication protocol which is attached as addendum G I believe 
this protocol retains the current options for adjudicatory findings and outcomes, uh, but it more appropriately focuses the adjudicatory evaluation on three pivotal phases of the jail experience, so to speak. Uh, that would be inmate intake procedures, inmate welfare procedures, and in-custody death procedures. Uh, additionally, we propose expanding the definition of substantially involved employees uh, for this adjudication protocol to include personnel that have uh, key responsibilities in maintaining the health and safety of, of LAPD inmates within the context of these three uh, pivotal uh, phases. The overarching goal of the inclusion of, of the involved employees for this new protocol is not only to identify possible misconduct, but to us equally as important, even in cases where there is not misconduct, to highlight areas of possible improvement following each incident. Uh, we believe that that is something that can be obtained for all incidents, whether there is some clear misconduct or negligence or not, something can always be learned from it. Um, and along those lines, I will quickly mention, um, falling from the adjudication uh, component, we believe that uh, the practice of reclassifying specifically in custody deaths that occur in these facilities to death investigations pursuant to special order number 10, uh, which was issued in 2011, um, should no longer happen. Um, we began reviewing in custody deaths for the five year period and initially found only 12 such deaths. Um, we found an additional seven um, that had been reclassified to death investigations. Uh, the first concern that we had was the lack of detail in those reports as compared to the very thorough and detailed in-custody death reports. Uh, the special order also allows explicitly for less, less extensive uh, investigation into the incidents. Um, and the purpose of the reclassification, of course, was to save time. Um, however, we found only seven deaths that occurred in the jails and holding tanks within a five-year period. Um, so uh, our office believes that because lessons can be learned uh, in each of these incidents, because there was only seven such incidents in these facilities over five years, um, that uh, the reclassification of in custody deaths for these facilities should be discontinued. Um, a few things that I alluded to in this summary that I believe are important, again, are the improvements that the department and CSD have already begun. Um, some of the examples of those um, towards our concerns brought up during the time period of this review. Classification and housing officer pilot program at 77th um, appears to be working to uh, resolve many of our issues with the communication barriers with intake and also the classification uh, decision, making it more thorough and more precise. Uh, there are some uh, serious revisions going into the inmate classification questionnaire, the last that we spoke. Um, and there is the implementation of the records management system, uh, which um, will hopefully make all of the documents electronic. It will expedite the processes um, so that uh, jail staff and arresting officers can better communicate through that system. Uh, lastly, I'd like to say the leadership at CSD was very instrumental in providing the OIG with all the information that we needed and access to the facilities that was necessary during this review, which we appreciate. Um, I thank you all for your time and attention today. Uh, any questions that anyone uh, has, I would be happy to answer on behalf of our office. Okay. I want to hear from the department, then we can do our, our questions. You know. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners, Chief, Mr. Tifank, and Mr. Smith. My name is uh, Vito Palazzolo, and I'm a commander in the Office of Special Operations, for which Custody Services Division is in the chain of command. With me to my right are Captain Rolando Solano, commanding officer, of Custody Services Division, and to my left, Commander Chris Pitcher of the Office of Special Operations. The report before you today is a collaborative effort between the IG's office and Custody Services Division. Since 2016, both entities have worked together in examining every facet of jail operations with the understanding and desire that the outcome will be an improvement in the way we care for those in our custody and in the safety of our jails. The department is in fundamental agreement with the tenor of the report that although there, although there is room for improvement of our facilities, our processes, and functions, overall we do a good job for caring for those in our custody. We appreciate the fresh set of eyes to point out what we may have overlooked. The report focused mostly on suicides and attempted suicides in our jails and temporary holding facilities at our police stations 
and made recommendations to reduce the risk of those incidents. In the six-year period examined by this report from 2012 to 2017, our facilities experienced four suicides and just over 100 attempted suicides. During this same period, our jail system processed and housed more than half a million inmates. By any measure, whether due to the circumstances leading to their detention or because of mental illness, which is prominently discussed in the report, or other influencing factors, the entire population was at the most vulnerable time of their life and most at risk to harm themselves. Nonetheless, one suicide is too many suicides, and the, and the department is committed to improving and finding ways to intervene in these situations. To that end, we welcome those fresh eyes looking at our operation and letting us know where we can improve. The department, and specifically Custody Services Division, works diligently to maintain the safety of all inmates and has made several improvements in the past few years in the screening of inmates on intake and in the monitoring of inmates that often goes beyond the minimum requirements of Title 15. The fact that staff could intervene more than 100 times to stop an inmate from committing suicide we believe is indicative of the efforts of our dedicated men and women and their desire to keep everyone safe. As I mentioned earlier, this report was a collaborative effort. As the team worked together to analyze data, facilities, procedures, and basic operations, it was evident that some things needed attention and there was no need to wait for the recommendations of this report. One of the first things initiated was the redesign of the screening form, which is at the center of a proper intake screening for each arrestee. The new form combines three forms into one, is more probative of the condition of the inmate and special needs, identifies the in whether the inmate is a vet veteran, whether the inmate is experiencing homelessness, and gathers information about mental illness and other medical conditions among many other background factors probed. This forum was designed with the assistance and input from the IG's office because, frankly, their input produced a better product. Outside of the scope of this report, that same collaboration conti continues today. We are currently in the process of revising the jail operations manual and designing new forms for our various procedures. In this effort, we have asked the IG's office to help us with the review in case we miss something or to make suggestions to make it better. Our improvements started as a result of this, excuse me, other improvements that started as a result of this collaborative effort are the initiation and the removal of suicide anchor points, the installation of video cameras in all the cells in our jail facilities, something that is near completion, increasing the amount of training custody personnel received relative to mental illness, and then initiation of the 30-day management review following an in-custody death, among others. These are all recommendations in the report, but we did not wait until we appear before you to get started on them. Additionally, as for the arrestee holding areas in our police stations, the Office of Operations this week is issuing a mandate that the checks that already take place daily at stations be more frequent and at random intervals and be specifically documented in the watch commander log as checks of arrestee holding areas. Some of the recommendations in this report are likely to have very significant financial impact or will impact resources beyond means that are available. These recommendations deserve a thorough analysis and discussion with our various entities that will be affected. The department has not had sufficient time to fully analyze and discuss these recommendations, so we are seeking to report back to you in one comprehensive response for all the recommendations in 45 days, either in a written report, verbally, or both. Additionally, because jail operations is so important to the department and there are so many risks and opportunities that are associated with the operation, we, will ask, we would ask the Commission to consider designating a jail operations subcommittee of two commissioners that the department can work with and the department can inform about jail issues on an ongoing basis. We are ready to take questions you may have. Okay. Commissioner McLean-Hill. 
Um, thank you. And uh, I first want to uh, compliment the OG's office, I mean, <laughs> the IG's office um, in connection with the um, comprehen comprehensiveness of this report and also to, uh, to say thank you to, um, to the department for its um, cooperation and its collaboration in uh, again, uh, seeking to put together the most definitive and uh, complete report to this commission possible. Um, I'm curious as to the specific recommendations. Um, I, you know, have read the report thoroughly and uh, in focused on all of the recommendations. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in those recommendations, which which the department is not prepared at this moment to commit to implementing. It sounded like. Um, like I heard that there might be some need to do additional review to determine the financial impact before um, you know they can be fully embraced. So can you tell me which those might be? Uh, yes, Commissioner. So uh, there is there's a number of recommendations that uh, would uh, require additional staffing, would require a change in in, in the procedures in the way we adjudicate the the in custody debts. And, uh, and the, uh, the investigation of in-custody debts is recommended by the Office of Inspector General. Those issues have not been discussed uh, at large with the, uh, the, the higher leadership of the department and to see what the financial impact for those things would be. One of the, one of the things that uh, the, the Inspector General recommended was the, the implementation, full-time implementation of the, uh, uh, the uh, classification and housing officer. This would require additional personnel, and we would have to see what type of impact this would have. So we just have not had the time since the report's release to, to uh, discuss these issues, analyze it, and see what the impact, the full impact would be. Um, I appreciate um, that particular recommendation. When I saw it, I realized that that was a personnel recommendation that would require, um, uh, you know, some significant, um, you know, uh, work on your part, but with respect to the adjudication, um, I'm really unclear as to why that's not a recommendation that could be accepted at, I mean, that could be fully implemented at this point. I mean, one of the things I will simply, uh, just by way of background, I mean, we all know that this report, as previously indicated, um, was requested following the um, in custody death of Wakisha Wilson, and in particular, um, represented our concerns about um, the level of care that um, and attentiveness that is provided to um, individuals who may be experiencing either mental health or suicide uh, suicidal tendencies um, you know in our care or in our custody these are all people who have not been convicted of anything so they're citizens that have been you know um, accused um, but that we are holding pending further procedures. So I'm very interested in making sure that we are doing everything possible from the perspective on the front end um, relative to classification, um, so on the intake um, side of things, um, while in custody that we are properly monitoring individuals and should there be um, a tragic uh, circumstance that we are reviewing those matters in a way that will, to uh, the uh, IG's point, offer us an opportunity to identify trends, to learn, and to also hold accountable um, any member who has not um, you know, followed appropriate um, procedures. So, setting aside the pers the recommendation relative to personnel um what is there about the reclassification or the the um the change in the adjudication process that would be difficult to implement yes so um you know because the report was made public on friday and we didn't get a, a copy of that till a day or so before that 
Uh, we just have not had a chance to talk with other entities within the department that are responsible for that particular area of uh, uh, um, uh, or responsibility uh, as far as the use of force and the adjudication uh, of, of such events. So not that uh, there would be any issue with the re, the re uh, uh, excuse me, with the adjudication so, so just, process. Hold on, I just want to understand because what I heard was about a lengthy process of uh, collaboration and review as the report was being developed. Are you saying that you were unaware of what the recommendations would be until Friday? Yeah, I was not aware of some of these recommendations. We were aware of most of them as far as the, the, the recommendation related to the uh, um, adjudication and related to the reclassification of death reports. I was not aware, no ma'am. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't want to, well, I've We'll let other people ask questions, but um, with respect to, because there are a number of, of recommendations, if you could go through them and tell me specifically which ones you, I mean, you've identified now three. Are there others that you are not prepared to accept at this point? Uh, yes, uh, yes, ma'am. So uh, with, uh, with uh, regard to recommendation number one, the removal of anchor points, uh, there are some problems in the, uh, in the removal of some of those anchor points, specifically the doors that have bars, which would require significant structural changes in those facilities that would, might put those facilities out of compliance with state law. So we would need to look at that a little bit better. Uh, and, and if those are done, um, it would require a substantial financial commitment from the city. Um, the, the uh, installation of video cameras and holding tanks. We're almost complete with the installation of holding, uh, excuse me, of video cameras in the cells. But the issue of installation of uh, video cameras and the holding tanks is one that we've requested uh, 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 budget, uh, budget for for the last six years, and each time that has not been approved. So uh, we need- So a couple things, because um, it sounds like you've got a long list. Um, I would, um, again, I'm, I am very interested in coming to, was interested in the report, am also um, very interested in uh, this commission providing specific direction and also in um, there being agreement around a specific set of recommendations that um, we can move forward with monitoring and interested in that occurring. Um, you know, yesterday. Uh, the report has been pretty significantly delayed from my perspective. It's been a very long time um, since uh, the commission has expressed its interest in reviewing these matters. Um, I appreciate your request that a subcommittee be appointed and- We'll do that, and, and I'd like you to, I'd like to, like you to be I one would, of the members, I would, please. I, um, I would, would uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Sobroff. Um, I would, um, would argue for or would um, be comfortable with the appointment of a subcommittee and this matter coming back to the commission, not in 45 days, but in, um, uh, you know, 30 and uh, or as soon thereafter uh, as possible. Um, I know that we've got a ton of scheduling issues, um, but um, I am interested in that occurring. I think we have a meeting on the 17th of July, is that? Yes, ma'am. Um, back at our, at our meeting on the 17th, which should give uh, everybody ample time to review the well, I'll appoint uh, the, the subcommittee today, so then you can make, see how far you can get to come back. Okay, any other uh, questions? Thank you. We have five common cards, sir. We have Mr. Herman, Adam Smith, John Williams. Props, kick that in the ass. 
So dealing with mental development disabilities, the civil rights of persons with developmental disabilities by federal and state rights and laws. In 1975, Congress enacted the Development for Disabilities Assistance and a Bill of Rights Act which provides funding for programs and expresses the federal goal of legal human rights for all people, color, race, and individual disability, Mr. T. Fank, with development of disabilities under 42 U.S.C. 15001 ETSEQ for the record. Manifests itself before the age of 22. No, it is likely to Off continue topic, Mr. indefinitely Herman. as results of disability. So apparently, the issue on disability falls under federal and state laws, which we, the people, are protected. Am I being biased, unfair to speak and be heard on my constitutional rights, my civil liberty and rights for justice, for all human beings, men and women? Do I have to ask for certification for intensive treatment? Oh, let me tell you about the story when I went to Metropolitan. Off topic. And the motherfucker. We'll be in handcuffs. Uh, next speaker, please. Well, I was home sick on a mental disability. Next speaker. Fuck you, Sobra, and fuck your development, and fuck your faggot based on I got 14 fucking seconds. So you can he can leave the uh, Mr. Herman uh, is out of the meeting. Get your stuff and we'll escort you out. Go go ahead. Um, go ahead. Can I get my two minutes? Thanks. Um, you call these deaths suicide. And without hyperbole, we know that that's not true. What happens to a person in someone else's custody and someone else's care is the fault of that custodian, and that makes it a homicide. Um, the commander mentioned that the video cam installation is near complete, um, but one of the troubling things in this report is it says, of the 10 attempted suicides, and I put that in quote, reviewed by the OIG involving the use of a telephone cord, nine of those predated Waukesha Wilson's killing in March of 2016. And the language of the report, it says, now prompted discussions of cordless telephone installation that should begin mid-2018. So I'm wondering what, if the video cams are so important, how come the cordless telephones that obviously are a problem haven't started yet? Um, <clears throat> in section E, it says, as a result of the demands of CSD personnel to properly identify and classify arrestees with mental illness, expert level training in these fields must be provided. Um, as Dr. Abdullah said a couple weeks ago, people go to school for four or six or eight years to become a mental health professional, and this report is suggesting that an annual or biannual training will be expert-level training. Even if someone were to give the OIG and this commission the benefit of the doubt in thinking, shut the fuck up, man, Jesus Christ, thinking that you all actually believe the expanded training will make two a extra difference. Seconds. So if you all believe that this expanded training will actually make a difference, people like choose to go to school to become mental health professionals, right? Like choose to go to school. I don't know why people would want to become jail guards for the LAPD, but I'm, but I'm quite sure that it's not because they have some burning desire to help people experiencing mental illness. And as this report states, the department's assessment is that a broad majority of arrestees booked at LAPD jails are suffering some form of mental illness. It's time to get the LAPD on the street and inside of these jails out of the business of mental health care. It's literally killing people. The next speaker, Jen Williams. Followed by General Jeff. Good morning. So um, first we have to say if it happens inside, it's not suicide. Um, it's neglect. We cannot um, arrest ourselves, kill our, like you guys are killing people with mental health issues. So this is obviously a real problem here. Just here in this own report, it says many cells lack video cameras that could alert jailers to suicide attempts or other problems. According to the report, 
At the police station holding tanks, there is no requirement for inmates to be regularly checked on by jail staff, nor does the department review jail suicides in a meaningful way. That's horrible. We know that John Horton Jr. didn't beat himself to death, but his killing was ruled a homicide. Also, in the case of Waukesha Wilson, 22 minutes of the tape is missing. Her death was ruled a suicide. We just had another killing in the jail of a 20-year-old college student named Quentin Thomas. Because he was in the foster system, there's some problem with his body being released, but when it finally was, his brain was missing. This happened in jail while he was in custody. There's a real problem. The officers don't want to wear their cameras, but you guys need to put them in those jails. General Jeff, followed by Jonathan Foster. <clears throat> General Jeff Skid Row. Um, first, it must be said that, um, you know, Waukesha Wilson, rest in peace, that this report should not have come after her death. Um, clearly, you know, by the department's own admission in their presentation today, there are numerous uh, improvements that needed to be made as a result of this report, which for a department with a $2 billion annual budget, they should have been, been, been able to do this on their own. Um, I definitely want to thank the OIG's office for this wonderful uh, uh, report. Um, most notably, this commission needs to take notice that in Mr. Ochoa's uh, opening presentation, he opened with giving the metrics of how they analyzed and did their report. Um, just uh, unlike uh, the department's uh, use of force policy, um, where this commission did not even ask and, and, and inquired about any fact checking, apply any fact checking metrics. A um, couple of different uh, uh, suggestions or, or recommendations. Um, it was interesting about the uh, cordless phone. Um, there should be a limiter um, to where the phone receiver does not ex go beyond two feet. Um, well, after it goes beyond two feet, it should automatically cut off because if there are multiple uh, inmates in the uh, holding tank, that uh, one, the bully doesn't just commandeer the receiver and no one else can use the, the, the phone. Uh, also, there is very, very interesting about the, uh, the HIPAA exceptions. Um, that's something that definitely needs to be lifted up. Um, it's interesting how that was not vetted all the way through. That was just kind of left open-ended. I would like that it needs to be spoken more to. Um, also, the transfer to uh, other uh, mental health facilities, um, that process needs to be mentioned. Um, and the lack of detail in, in records and in custody deaths was a very, very important point. And uh, it's a wonder why. I'll get to that later. Thank you, Jeff. Jonathan Foster. Jonathan. Is this the last speaker on this? Yes, sir. Okay. Hi, it's definitely not enough time, but uh, on your funding, you know, um, the Department of Defense is missing $23 trillion. So maybe that's where your money went. It's, it's getting sucked out of here at gunpoint with tax dollars, and then they don't know where they spent it. So no one uh, is above the law, not even Jesus because God is a lawful God, and on Wilkesha Wilson, Chief Charlie Beck did not go into the jail and kill her. Beck did not do that. He and the commission are <clears throat> and have committed gross negligence. The jail personnel definitely committed gross negligence in their handling and care of Miss Wilson. To me, as well as the family, feel this is also should be prosecuted and a much larger settlement should be considered. <clears throat> this falls on the medical staff. Um, they gave, so to speak, a malpractice, but they're missing 22 minutes, and that should result in $22 million settlement because covering up the crime is worse than the crime. So they're able to cap damages by not charging the staff with a crime, something related or with similarity to negligence, when actually not following protocol should be looked into as a civil rights crime. If it's possible to link the crime, uh, if, they, if they aren't charging a crime, then the settlement, uh, if they can charge a crime, sorry, if they can charge crime, then the settlement can increase. Also, since medical malpractice 
seen as connected to medical staff. The jail staff is not medical staff, and so they may be uh, able to show the amount uh, uh, that they should be awarded. The $22 million covers the civil rights viola violation, the negligence. And this is where uh, the substantial increase comes from. Yeah, uh, Maybe you will find a physical issue with a holding tank, but in relation to Miss Wilson, the human being committed a gross civil rights violation. Thank you. And we have no other comment cards on this item. Okay, um, I will um, today after the meeting appoint a, a subcommittee on this um, consisting of Commissioners McLean Hill and Commissioner Johnson. And uh, now I'd like to uh, approve the Inspector General's report uh, a motion for that. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sobroff, I, I think that the appropriate motion at this, the, the appropriate action at this time would be to continue the report um, and to allow some work to be done with the department and um, the IG's office and the commission staff um, in committee and to bring the item back in um, as an amended report? Well, to bring the item back in 30 days, it may or may not be amended, but it would you know, provide the department with the time to respond to the recommendations okay. before okay. we- Do you wanna, um, you wanna make that motion? So uh, I move that we continue uh, this item to uh, you know, the next available- July 17th. To July 17th. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thanks, thank you guys. Good start. Okay, we're now on item number 2E, department's report dated June 13, 2018, relative to the domestic violence audit. Um, also, just on this last item while they're leaving, I did want to underscore again um, how much, uh, how important the collaboration has been and how much we appreciate everybody's work in getting us to this point. So thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, do we see the need for, uh, for the report? We've read the report. Do we have questions on the, the domestic violence audit? Commissioners? Do you want to give a, a brief summary of the report? Commander, would you like to just go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Sir Joe Sice, um, Audit Division, a Police Performance Auditor. Yeah, uh, we conducted a uh, audit of uh, domestic violence um, pursuant to a uh, report from the city controller's office that was published in the city of Los Angeles domestic violence services and programs audit uh, as a result of that as a result of our audit uh, we had findings and uh, the main findings were on objective number 1a domestic violence victim information notification uh, everyday uh, pamphlet issued uh, we came back with a 66% compliance rate. Right. And the other significant one was objective number 3A, which is the non-custodial investigative deadline right. that came back with a 62%. What were the causes of the deadlines, sometimes missed by a couple of weeks? Uh, Commander, would you like to uh, address yeah, that? Sure. <laughs> Commander Chris Pitcher, representing the uh, Office of Operations. In regard to objective 1A, um, that was the uh, domestic violence victims pamphlet um, where we met uh, 40 of 61 of those where we were able to disseminate that pamphlet. 66% mm -hmm. met standard, uh, which meant that uh, we basically didn't pass out that pamphlet or make reference to that pamphlet within the, uh, the domestic violence incident report that the officers completed. In any event, uh, the primary cause for that was that the officers didn't have it out in the field and they had run out of the what they call the domestic violence victims pamphlet uh, the dvv at the areas so the officers weren't able to take it out with See? them to the field okay the uh, the remedy for that uh, ultimately is the department is working with uh, detective bureau uh, and itb they're developing a process where they can uh, basically uh, electronically disseminate that DVV to anybody, to their phone, to their email, to their any place of choosing um, that way so that that alleviates the need to carry a large supply. But uh, in any event, we still have to have uh, the, the paper copies for those who do not have emails or access to 
the uh, the electronic version, and that is going to be handled by the uh, direct reports uh, from the uh, director's office as well as the bureau uh, commanding officers uh, relative to making sure that the area records has an adequate supply of the DVV and it is distributed and carried with the officers in the field. Okay. Um, time frame for follow-up inspection so we can bring it back. There is going to be a, we are going to have in about uh, six months, and that kind of dovetails into the second uh, area that uh, we didn't too, okay. too hot on, which is objective uh, 3A, uh, the non-custodial investigative deadline, I think that you were alluding to, uh, where it requires us to complete these investigations within 30 days uh, and or have an exemption documented within that report. Uh, of the 34 investigations that were uh, looked at, only 21 of them met standard. We had two areas, Hollenbeck and Southeast, each had uh, four and three investigations respectively that didn't meet those standards. And ultimately, they weren't completed within a timely manner. What they cited as their primary concern was staffing issues with the detectives and their inability to complete those investigations within the 30 days as required. So to that end, uh, I had spoken to both of the, uh, the commands um, to address it. And uh, the remedy for that uh, essentially is now they've, they've done about four or five different things. First and foremost, the uh, domestic violence table coordinators are now going to assign the investigations in a more timely manner, which will give them the full 30 days to conduct the investigations rather than waiting till they get a hold of the victims and start the investigations Good. late. So that's the first uh, remedy. The second is uh, they're going to address the personnel shortages by uh, these commands, start moving the light duty personnel from patrol and from the areas within the area commands over to the detec detective tables to help them with their follow-ups and contacting victims and moving those along so that they can get these investigations done within 30 days. Good. Uh, the third is the detective supervisors on the domestic violence tables are now going to send out the contact letters and the forms, uh, alleviating the investigators of that duty, giving them once again more time to conduct these follow-ups and take more time uh, during the investigative stage. Uh, fourth, the uh, coordinator and the detective CEOs now are going to conduct their own domestic violence audits to ensure that every case meets that 30-day standard and or in rare exceptions they're going to receive an exemption from the uh, the detective uh, CO relative to that case and last uh, my own uh, inspection unit from the office of operations is going to be conducting a six-month follow-up audit to ensure that these two areas are now under compliance that will be done within 60 or uh, six months and we will report back to the Commission relative to its findings great Okay, do we have uh, public comments on this item? We have none, sir. Okay, let's uh, I'll move approval of the department's report, recommendation. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move to the chief's report. Good, good morning, commissioners. Thank you, President Soboroff. Uh, I'll begin with the one officer-involved shooting that we had this past week. Uh, on June 16, 2018, at approximately 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Van Nuys Patrol Division uniformed officers responded to an ambulance cutting radio call at a homeless outreach center located on the 6400 block of Tyrone Avenue. The officers confronted a suspect who was armed with a large knife. The officers ordered the suspect to drop the knife and utilized less lethal options, including a beanbag shotgun, to uh, attempt to gain compliance. Uh, unfortunately, the suspect then grabbed a female bystander and held a knife to her neck, resulting in an officer-involved shooting. The suspect and the female hostage were injured. The Los Angeles Fire Department responded and transported them to local hospitals uh, where the suspect was pronounced dead. Um, an additional female victim from the initial radio call that brought the officers there was transported uh, by LAFD also to a local hospital and she was fortunately treated and released. No officers were injured and Force Investigation Division is uh, continuing their investigation on that. Um, looking at the crime picture for the week ending June 16th, violent crime citywide was down 2.7%. Um, last year at this time, year to date, we were up 1.6%, so we are still continuing to trend um, in a good direction and we hope to continue that focus through the upcoming busy summer. Property crime citywide is down 3.3% 3 .3 
And again, last year at this time, we were up 0.9%. Overall, Part 1 crime citywide is down 3.2%. Last year, conversely, we were up 1.1% at this time. Uh, we had five homicides this past week. Um, our numbers uh, looking through Monday, 125 homicides year to date uh, versus last year at this time with 135. That's a decrease of 7.4%. Uh, we are glad to uh, discuss the decrease we are seeing in that trend in shooting victims. We are down 107 a year to date, that's 20.7% compared to 2017 numbers. So that's 409 versus 516 at this time last year. With regard to gang related crime year to date, we are down 22.9%, gang related homicides down 32.9%, and gang related shooting victims down 34.7%. With regard to the traffic picture, looking at all traffic collisions citywide year to date, down 1.5%. In traffic collisions resulting in death citywide, down 5.5%. Serious injury traffic collisions are down 4.8%. Yet in two specific areas, the department still remains challenged. Uh, as we try to pursue the goals of Vision Zero. And one of those is in the area of motor vehicles versus pedestrians, up slightly in the serious injury category, uh, up 1.2%, which equates to two additional victims in our city who had suffered uh, serious injury due to a motor vehicle uh, collision with a pedestrian. Also very concerning to us are bicycle involved traffic collisions. While citywide we are down in totality 2.2%, that's uh, nine collisions. Those involving serious injury are up by 12 or 33%, and those resulting in death up by four victims year to date. Looking at department personnel, total of LAPD sworn, we're at the strength of 10,026. Our civilian employees and partners, 2,938. Um, that still encompasses 412 civilian vacancies. Um, our fully funded strength, as you know, is 10,033 for sworn, and cadets, uh, 1,799. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Chief. Do we have public comments on the Chief's report? Yes, sir. We have four cards. We have Valerie Rivera, General Jeff, Jonathan Foster, and Adam Smith. No, she... Um, she she hasn't done this yet. She's on done public, public comment. This is the chief's report. Okay, chief's report. Okay. Um, it's a shame Charlie Beck's not here today to finish out his last week, but it's no surprise that he's not here because uh, he's just as much of a coward and a poor excuse of a cop as Arturo Yurti and Daniel Ramirez. Um, I truly just wish that you all would have really looked into Eric's case because um, we all know that the, those cops made mistakes after mistakes after mistakes after mistakes. And for y'all to find that in policy just doesn't make any sense. Um, what truly happened was they executed Eric because they made mistakes. Eric didn't make any mistakes. They made mistakes and they took Eric's life because of their mistakes. And, and that's wrong. That's wrong. And it's sad that you all think it's okay for them to have done something like that. I know, I get it, I get it. You guys get a lot of police shootings. You guys get a lot of reports. You guys have to handle this day after day. I get it. But Eric's case is different. He not only got shot, but he got ran over with an out of control vehicle. And they were making mistakes even in the dispatch calls. For them to call in and make it look like he, like the officer was shot? <laughs> How the hell can he sit there and honestly believe he was shot when he fell and tripped and hurt himself? And it's just sad that you guys aren't having any empathy or even concern about this matter. Because there's two seriously murderous cops out there still. 
And I, I wish, you know, I wish that they weren't out there anymore. And you guys could have had some, a part of it, but you guys chose not to have a part of it. And, you know, I just. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. General Jeff. Jeff, it's on the Chief's report. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. General Jeff Skid Row. Uh, unfortunately, it's sad that uh, lame duck and limbo Chief Beck isn't here today, but, you know, we've got Chief uh, Gramala here. That's a fine officer. Um, but in that report, it was uh, an uh, officer involved shooting where a hostage was involved, held at knife point. And so I can't wait to hear the details on that, because basically what you're saying is there was an officer that took a innocent, I'm sorry, there was a suspect that took an innocent civilian and held him hostage at knife point, and yet the officer somehow has this pinpoint precision to shoot him while holding somebody at knife point, whereas just, what was it, a month ago in the Crenshaw Mall, there was a, 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 a gentleman running down the mall and the officer's shooting bullets flying all over the place. I don't believe the department is that accurate with their, with their, with their, with their, their bullets, and so, um, that's endangering lives. You know, while maybe this effort was successful, I would be in fear of my life if someone's got a knife around my neck and I'm taking hostage and I got a LAPD officer, you know, shooting at the suspect when I'm in, 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 in point blank range or in line of fire. That, that's dangerous. I can't wait to hear this report because right there, that's an admission that there are tactical, tactical errors. You know, that shouldn't be happening. There should have been a SWAT team call, you know, MEU unit. That's a whole different uh, procedure. Uh, yeah, that's, that was dangerous. So I can't wait to hear how that unfolds. Hopefully that, uh, uh, it'll go beyond closed session and we get to hear, uh, you know, the findings on that. Um, you know, obviously, Chief's not here. His legacy is tainted. Um, you know, we're still trying to figure out what, it, what the, the fiasco with the horse and his daughter um, you know, leaving with this, the, this, the mur most murderous police law enforcement agency in the nation, uh, you know, in custody deaths, you know, this is in disarray, you know, all these false data and statistics, homelessness not happening. There's a lot of problems, you know, ready for the new chief. Let's move forward. Thanks, Jeff. Jonathan Foster. Mr. Foster. On the Hi, chief's John report. Jonathan Foster. Yeah, I would have shot the guy with the knife because it was a hostage situation. I would have just wasted him, too. And uh, I want to say that Trump brought the crime down. The LAPD did not, and neither did Garcetti. They didn't bring the crime down. And uh, leadership doesn't take an end-of-career party like Chief Beck. That's not leadership. Uh, I can tell that from the type of leadership does not exist in Charlie Beck. Seemed to try to do good. He did try to do good. But the work that has taken place could not have taken place 30 years ago. And not many people, just, just about... No one 30 years ago was applying the protocol changes that have been presented for adoption in the recent years. No one thought this way 30 years ago when he was on the force and the other guy coming up was on. <laughs> and the highlights, the lack of leadership issues that plagued the police force and plagued police departments all over the nation because leadership is weak and is double minded. Police officers are shot. And I, that's why I came down here, because that's what I want to stop. And the public sometimes gets killed for no real reason. This leadership is coming from the public. And then this false leadership gets to throw a party and pat itself on the back. If this leadership is coming from the public, means Charlie, Willie, Bratton, Gates, and Parks are not leaders. They are told by the public, and then they respond. So... I'd like to see leadership. It would be, I, I think some things are happening that are incredible though. You know, why does it have to take 30 years? This is my questions. And I'm 47. I started out playing drums at two. Your brain will never keep up with mine. I was already thinking this when I was five and six and seven. Why has, and that's, that's 76, 77, 78. Why isn't it changed yet? Adam Smith. So I wasn't really going to speak to the report today, but I think it's always important to think about the narrative that, you know, that report puts on the public here, um, specifically into the ears of the uh, media in the back. 
and you talk about the officer involved shooting and like general jeff said so the person was holding a woman with a knife um and from what i understand the woman was also shot is that true i guess you don't have to answer that but so this woman was potentially shot by an officer who also killed the guy with the knife um and if that's the case, if this woman was shot by a police officer, how is that not a significant is incident and activity occurring during the period of June twelfth to June nineteenth? Um, because you know that the you know the L.A. Times and whoever else is just going to say that this officer-involved shooting happens, and unless this the chief's report states that a woman was also shot, that's not going to be included, um, and it's unfair to you know it's just. One of the other stats that is always talked about is the uh, supposed quote-unquote gang shootings and the number of gang whatever um, statistics that you all come up with. And I was wondering, speaking of come up and coming up with statistics, on the front page of the LAPD website, it says how many officers are currently sworn and all that kind of stuff, the square mileage of the city. But it also always says there's 45,000 gang members. <clears throat> And it just seems like such an arbitrary number, and I'm wondering who's like counting that week to week. Or, um, and one last thing is when we talk about you talk about the number of um, shootings going going down, or the number of homicides going down, the number of officers killing civilians is never included in that. Um, so I think that those are also fake statistics. We have no other comment cards on this item. Okay, let's go back to the uh, consent. There only, uh, there's only. We have one, uh, one card on one F and one card on one G. One F and G. Okay, so let's approve items A, B, I'll, I'll all the others. I'll, I'll move items A, B, C, E, H, I, J, and K. Okay. Okay. And E. And E. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the, the comment cards are on what? 1F and 1G, we have Adam Smith. Smith, you want to talk about those? This is uh, air, regarding air support. Yep. So we've got $27,541 of a donation from the Police Foundation for tablets applications and an aircraft start unit. The report says the tablets and software applications will allow flight crews to make rapid and accurate performance calculations to enhance operational safety and improve effectiveness when conducting specialized missions. What does that mean? Um, do you all know what that means? Like where the police foundation are buying these things from? What are specialized missions in this specific circumstance? I mean, I know it says it in a report, but do, do you magically know what missions these are talking about? Um, I'm not necessarily accusing the board of not knowing what these donations are actually for, but I do wonder. Mr. Smith on one G. You want G or no? So this one's for two GoPro cameras um, that will be used by personnel to document incidents where having video would be beneficial. And that's a quote. Um, who decides what type of incident would benefit from more police surveillance? Mm -hmm. What is the video on these cameras going to be used for? Will it be uploaded to fusion centers and stored? Is there a forthcoming policy about public access to the footage from these cameras? Um, as mentioned after the use of force report, every officer already has body-worn video. Every patrol car supposedly has a dash cam that they can use or can't use depending on who they want to kill that day. Um, so if LAPD officers continue to use this equipment to the detriment, of the public they're purporting to serve and protect. And this commission is not holding officers accountable for not following specific directives like turning on the dash cams. Why are they getting more cameras? I'm not necessarily accusing the board of not knowing what these donations are actually for, but I do wonder. Okay, we have a motion for approval on F and G. Yes. Second? Second. All, second. Second, all those in favor? Aye. All right, okay, let's go to um, Public comment? Public comment, yeah, how many do you have? We have seven comment cards. Go ahead. We have Clint Blakely, General Jeff, Adam Smith. Clint, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, so this is the uh, second police commission meeting that I've been to, and uh, 
just want to say that it's been, frankly, very upsetting um, what I've seen happen at these past couple meetings. Uh, the, uh, the people that presented to you today were clearly um, unprepared and had not done the, uh, what was necessary um, for what they were working on. And um, I'm wondering why it was only Commissioner McLean Hill who questioned, or, or who, you, you, I mean, Commissioner Soboroff was asking to, uh, who was about to approve the, um, the Inspector General's report on jail and holding tank structures, even after that there was clearly um, things missing with it and uh, things that hadn't been approved. So um, I'm just wondering why there's clearly a lack of um, responsible leadership from this commission, and I'm very disappointed. Thank you. Next. General Jeff. Jeff. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, General Jeff uh, Skid Row. Um, just to uh, finish my other, a couple of my points uh, from the uh, OIG's report on jails. Uh, Parker Center could be used to house homeless. There's a homeless crisis. Uh, what else did I have? Um, I hope that this uh, commission in the OIG's office does not allow the department to gut the report. Um, clearly, the department is putting forth um, issues, especially when they talk about financial um, needs. Uh, they're already getting $2 billion of, of taxpayer funding. Uh, they should not send that bill over to the city where the city is going to cost more taxpayer funding. Um, you know, those recommendations need to be, those changes definitely need to be made. And so we hope that we, the people, hope that this uh, commission and the OIG's office will hold steadfast. Uh, also, I want to say that uh, officially speaking, I stand in solidarity with Valley Rivera. Um, it's unfortunate about the uh, loss of her son, Eric Rivera. And it's, it's quite troubling to hear that officers doesn't even know how to operate a, a motor vehicle. I think that this commission should uh, question and, and put forth a, a recommendation to have send this officer back for uh, uh, motor vehicle training um, to not be able to, in any type of a chase, uh, you know, to put a, operate a vehicle to pull in park. Also to check the, uh, the mental health status. I don't know if this officer has the wherewithal to be able under high intensity and intense uh, pressure circumstances to function mentally. Uh, it seemed there's a whole lot of disconnect there. They got discombobulated and that it resulted in the death of Valerie Rivera's son, which is an embarrassment to the city. Adam Smith, followed by Ruth Goldberg, Ives, and Jonathan Foster. Come on, let's go. Go ahead. Um. I do want clarification on the water rule, um, the drink rule. I don't feel like we've had any yet. I know that you had a drink this morning. Um, I understand that you are a, in a position of power that we are not in, but um, at least some kind of explanation as to who's allowed to bring in drinks, um, perhaps some reasoning behind it. I think it's also always important to talk about accessibility here. Um, more and more we're getting pushed back. We're not allowed to sit in these two front rows because um, Chief Beck is scared and you know week after week there's more and more police and you expect people to come here on a tuesday morning you said this morning like the consent agendas were gonna get or consent agenda items got bumped you said after closed session so i'm glad they weren't at least after closed session um but, you know this is a significant part of the day of people's regular work lives um and we shouldn't feel people shouldn't be tried to make feel intimidated um, there should be you know if you have to have 40 cops lining this room it should be the same every week it's not if there's only certain seats that police can sit in only certain seats that the demagoguing public to quote our illustrious chief um, are allowed to sit in like you know that should be consistent 
We shouldn't be made to move, especially mothers and family members that come here to, you know, try to figure out why you all keep approving these murders. But anyway, yeah, I'd love, you know, some info on the water. Next speaker. Ruth Goldberg. Morning. Good morning, Your Honors. Um, this is my first time here, so please forgive me if I am not perfect in my presentation. But I am concerned because my Christian duty is being thwarted, I believe, by the uh, Hollywood division on, Wil on Wilcox. I was there yesterday, and I have written out uh, this. It's a First Amendment uh, issue um, uh, addressed to the commission today, petition for a hard copy of the Los Angeles Police Department organizational directory to use as a tool for locating credible, confidential guidance, counsel, and advice from sworn licensed detectives. Um, and this is a First Amendment, as I said, a Christian motivation. Uh, and I just arrived in Hollywood, really, uh, and registered in the Blessed Sacrament Parish. Um, and um, I uh, began attending the community groups at the center uh, um, which is a converted convent, uh, issues came up and I really needed an official word, advice, and counsel from a sworn, licensed, experienced senior detective. For this reason, I went to the Hollywood Division Police Station as a seeker of credible advice and guidance and counsel from a senior detective. I went there transparently, openly, honestly, without any guile or deceit or subterfuge. But the response was um, monumentally disappointing the desk uh, avoided granting my petition, and the desk officer gave me a telephone number to call that led nowhere, certainly not to the detectives that I was seeking. But, uh, but it was very unhelpful, and, um, uh, and it was an unidentified voicemail. I'm not particularly wise in the ways of the world or Hollywood, uh, Your Honors, but even a novice, um, uh, and it occurred to me that I, it would be perilous and negligent and possibly dangerous to leave a confidential message entirely clueless as to who was being to, going to listen to it. I felt betrayed right then and there. I felt that I was being stonewalled and hung out to dry and uh, treated dismissively, and it hurt my feelings. Okay, so, someone will talk to you right after the meeting. If you hang in here. Okay? All right, thank you thank so you. much. Jonathan Foster, please. Mr. Foster. I am Jonathan Foster. Um, I do have a recording of Chief Beck saying the words two-bit politicians. So I, I know he knows what's up in a lot of ways. But where is the recording of Eric Garcetti, the Eric Garcetti cam? So the people can review the discussions on how the Chief Moore was going to keep uh, the law breaking in place with Special Order 40. Where is the Garcetti cam? the video that documents the discussions to conspire to break the law. Where is the cam? We need to have a, we need to see what the discussions were with Eric and Moore to pick who the chief is. This has been among the very best experiences for my life coming here, taught me what I wished to know in part. So much to say, I'd like to do awesome things, and then I realized if I got done what I'd like to see done, I will be killed. Ask President Kennedy and ask Bobby. They're dead. These people were killed for wanting to do the same thing I would like to do. Two good people with the same, outco same outcomes. They got shot dead. It's been revealing to me ICE and the overall federal government, Congress, billionaires, and police commissions all over the nation colluding means there's no way for me to get done what I'd like to see done because I am going to be killed just like them. If I get done what I want to see done, I'm going to be killed. Or I have to shut up. So, um, you know, I had to think, do I want to die today for real? If I want to see get done what I'd like to see get done. They already tried. People have been trying. They're dead. And this is what taught me. And, and actually, when I walked out of the door, that's when I looked up and I saw the, the, the picture of President Kennedy. And that's when it hit me. I said, he has already tried to do what I'd like to see done. And they wasted him. They'll waste you, Jonathan. They'll waste you, too. The next uh, three speakers, and those are the last speakers, Zach Sherwin, Jacqueline Richardson, and Bridget Hutt. Um. 
in this cold and professionalized and literally weaponized environment, um, I just wanted to take a real human moment and acknowledge again the families of people who've been killed by LAPD, personified and represented today by Valerie Rivera. Um, the photograph in the use of force report of uh, his water gun, the color photograph, uh, especially among all those guns and knives is heartbreaking. And uh, I think it's an emblem of shame. Um, you know, a, a couple speakers have acknowledged that the feeling in this room can be somewhat hostile and intimidating. I, I've been to police commission meetings that have been more confrontational than today's has been, but there was a moment long at the beginning of the meeting a long time ago when some speaker up here finished making the remarks, and Mr. Soboroff, you said to the USC dean who is here in a remark that I interpreted sarcastic as sarcastic, you can stay till the end of the meeting if you want, we'll be here till two o'clock. And to me, that's a small moment, but it says so much about the tone in here. It gives me the impression that you would rather that we aren't up here making comments. And I just wanted to say that we would also rather not be here. Nobody wants to come to these meetings. It's not fun for us. It's certainly not fun for me, and I'm white. I don't live in fear that I will be killed by a police officer. I've never had a relative or a close friend who was. I can sense the, hosti the hostility and intimidation, so I can't imagine what it's like to be Valerie Rivera, the mother of Eric, or the family of Waukesha Wilson, Wilson or Gashario Mack, or other people who've been killed by LAPD officers. With the trauma and grief that they've experienced, they still show up to the bowels of LAPD headquarters, listen to these reports, endure the general tone of the room, including the presence of all these armed officers, and they wait for their two or four minutes to convey what they're feeling and to tell you what they and their communities need. I think the commission should be grateful that these people show up and make time to comment um, despite their heartbreak and anger and to express to you their experiences of this state-sponsored violence. And I support the families of victims like Eric Rivera, Rivera Waukesha Wilson, and Grishario Mack. Jacqueline Richardson. This is in regard to holographs. People have told me these things. I don't know all of them uh, by personal experience, just a few. Uh, some people said that there were holographs walking all over the city, downtown Los Angeles. They said, all of them are holographs. They were laughing. I'm not holograph. You're not holograph. So they're exceptions. Uh, they also said uh, some holographs are starting kindergarten right now. And some said uh, a few are going out to UCLA to get educated. I wonder if they're going to trade school also. Uh, birds, cats, dogs, horses can be holographed. If you ever go into a room and something is going above the ceiling and you don't see it, that could be a holographed bird. And they can also drop bugs on people if they're mad at them. Uh, the people that say they hear holo they have holographed holograph birds in their house are not crazy. They can be sent directly to somebody's house. Uh, some of us, uh, people on Skid Row, I believe, are holographs. No one told me that, but I believe uh, some people on, on Skid Row uh, may be holographs. Uh, I've seen about five people that have uh, people that look just like them. Uh, I didn't discuss it with them. Uh, uh, the people that used to work with me at these little jobs I had, uh, looks like they have, one's darker. Uh, one girl has two holographs that skinnier, one older than she is. I don't want to talk to the holographs to see what's going on. I don't want to deal with the holographs. Um, I believe uh, some of the people on Skid Row who are holographs are getting food stamps and uh, GI checks, the ones that have two, one, they look like each other. That, that means the, the, the uh, food stamps and the uh, GI checks are going to a different address under a different name. Uh, some people are making their own holographs. They get cameras and take pictures of people. I believe they're making those people into holographs without their knowledge. Next speaker. Hello. Hello. My name is Bridget Hewitt. H-U-I-T. I'm not here to speak on excessive force. I'm here to speak on the human trafficking. I have been trying to get with Ms. Hill. Mr. Johnson, I've been to every government entity, Maxine Waters, Karen Bass, uh, Feinstein, Garcetti. I would like to speak with someone about the human trafficking. I've come equipped with microscope. I have pictures here of what has come out of my head. This 
is no joke. This came out of my head. If no one here believes me, I also have tweezers. You could pick any strand that's left and put it under here, and you're going to see these. You're going to see this come from my head. I need help. I've been asking for a long time. Every officer tells me, we don't handle this. We don't have a report for this. You're crazy, okay? I know the officer that did this to me. I know where they're at. I know the cameras. I know everything that's being done to me and my family. We are taking pictures. Now I'm pulling shit out of me and my children's heads, our eyelashes, our faces. These are in us. If you don't believe me, any one of you, anyone here, pick a strand, put it under here. This is a child's mic uh, microscope. A hundred times, six hundred times, and twelve hundred times. Take what's left in my head and just put one on here. I'm not lying. Me and my family need help. We're being poisoned. We're being followed. We're being worked on at night when we are asleep. We are being put to sleep. We got chemicals. I've been trying to save evidence for years. I can't go no further. We're dying in my house. I need help. I've tried to speak to every last one of you. My phone is hacked. My computer. Thank you. Let's go to. Um, we have no other public comment cards. Um, we're on item number five. And please let the record reflect. Item number five, A4 should read L-E-R-I. Number 05517, and that stands for Law Enforcement Related Injury. We do have two common cards. We have a card on 5A1 and 5A4. We have Adam Smith. On both? Yes. Mr. Smith, 5A1, 5A4. Mr. Smith? Go ahead. Hello. So I know that this. So the shooting of Samuel Alamillo from last year um, that is continued from last week. We know that his brother and I think his mother were here last week. And when we were leaving, um, you know, the liaison made a point to tell them that it would take about an hour. Um, and I just hope that there's communication with his family still, because I don't see them in the room today. Um, and again, like speaking to accessibility, you know, it's really hard for working folks to get here. Um, so I just hope that, <clears throat> you know, it wasn't because you guys, someone had to go to lunch last week and you're going over I mean, you can shake your head, but it's not exactly unbelievable to think that this commission would do something disrespectful to the community. That's all I have. And then I didn't hear the misclassification for the other one. It should read L-E-R-I, Law Enforcement Related Injury. Gotcha. So that's why I didn't show up on the list. That's all. Okay. We have no other cards, sir. Okay. The Board of Police Commissioners will now recess into closed session to discuss item numbers 5A1, 2, 3, and 4 in accordance to Government Code 54957.
Okay. Commission is back from closed session. Uh, the decisions in closed session as to 5A1. I'm sorry, excuse me. 5A, yes, 5A1. Chief's recommendations were adopted as relevant to tactics with the exception of one police officer, two. Chief's recommendations that accepted and adopted as drawing and exhibiting, less lethal use of force, and lethal use of force unanimous 4-0. As to one police officer, two, tactics administrative disapproval, vote was 3-1. As to item 5A2, Chief's recommendations unanimously adopted. 5A3, Chief's recommendations unanimously adopted. 5A4, Chief's recommendations unanimously adopted. Records should reflect items on item 5A1. Four commissioners were present on the vote as to 5 a two, three, and four, three commissioners were present. That concludes the report. We have a motion for adjournment. To adjourn. Second, all in favor? Aye. Excellent. Cut, print, we're moving on. Hi, I'm Shane Woodson on the set of Cain and Abel here in Hollywood. You're watching LA City View. Channel 35, our city, our channel. Okay, I need my actors back on set, back in position. The more we get together, 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 the more we get together, the happier.